So I think I think we can start. Uh, yes, uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you for being here for the second day of uh, this conference, Women's Narratives and European Integration History. I hope you have a nice night and you are ready to rumble for the second day at here. Uh, 13.30. Today I will present the first uh, panel today, and uh, so uh, I think you know who I am, Francois Klein, working at the C2DH Center for Contemporary <laughs> and Digital History, uh, more particularly focused on uh, oral history and European integration history. And uh, I will give the floor to my uh, very colleague, uh, Elena Danescu, who you already all know already. And uh, she will present uh, the project we are currently working on. Elena, you have the floor. Thank you very much. So um, I uh, will present you the project that uh, we are uh, realizing currently. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the presentation from today is entitled Women in International Relations in Luxembourg, Pioneers in Their Memory. And it's a part uh, of our ongoing research project entitled The Role of uh, Women in Luxembourg uh, European and International Relations. The structure of our presentation is based um, first of all, um, of the idea uh, of integrating oral history and multimedia research as an innovative methodology and new content creation in developing research projects. Then I will focus more precisely on what uh, are the main purposes of the uh, project on, uh, on the role of women. And um, in the last part, I will present you some findings um, presented under this lens of the uh, women in diplomatic relations of Luxembourg. So, um, one of our uh, specificities that we brought uh, at a university in, in 2015, coming from the Centre Virtuel de la Connaissance sur l'Europe, is this methodology and uh, the projects in oral history. For instance, uh, for the project Pierre Werner and Europe uh, that I carried uh, out uh, between 2011 and 2017 based on undisclosed archives or, uh, of Pierre Werner family, we realized together with Francois 32 interviews, so about 55 hours of high-definition audiovisual recordings you see the list of the interviewees, and you see their figures. And among them, we have uh, also interviewed two um, outstanding uh, women, uh, Vivian Reding and Astrid Luling. But um, uh, the, these uh, ladies uh, talked about uh, economic and monetary union and Pierre Werner. The third lady is Pierre Werner's daughter, Marianne Werner. Uh, then we use this audiovisual material, which is published on the uh, research infrastructure of the university, in realizing other multimedia research outputs, especially a biographical documentary on Pierre Werner and Europe, uh, a podcast series that Francois realized for, for the radio uh, Honat, Sieben which is the main public radio in Luxembourg. And also, uh, we uh, shared all this uh, material uh, with EUE Florence on a specific portal uh, uh, set up on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of the uh, Werner report. During all this time, we worked on, uh, on the consolidation of the methodology and uh, in um, uh, getting best practices for repository in oral history. Um, 
Since 2022, uh, we launched the project, sorry, we launched the project, the role of women in European and international relations in Luxembourg after the Second World War, uh, with the objectives to conduct interviews, 10 interviews per year, with women from a wide range of backgrounds, uh, political uh, background, uh, diplomatic, uh, trade unions, cultural, um, and so on, um, academia, uh, who's left a mark on European inter in, uh, and international relations in Luxembourg, then to publish them in full as, as a series of themed excerpts uh, and in transcription form on the C2DH research infrastructure and on the dedicated platform, to uh, add at this publication a digital methodology and a toolbox concerning network analysis or distant reading in order to go more in depth uh, with this analysis and then uh, to share uh, this uh, output uh, with the uh, historical archives as well as with Jean Monnet uh, Foundation in Lausanne. You will see on the screen and also behind me uh, the label of this project, having as rationale uh, the fact that despite that Luxembourg has had emblematic uh, figure active in international relations and in, uh, in the representation of the country's interests in Europe and in the world since uh, uh, 1945, they have been always masculine. Women seem to remain in the shadow of the history, but would it, this conclusion true or false? So in order to uh, establish uh, the good uh, uh, um, analysis, we uh, precise four research questions. Who are the pioneering women in the European and international relation of Luxembourg? What are their life stories? Uh, what, um, what was their uh, academic, professional, political background, with what entanglements and what kind of networking. The third research question is what, are, what were the major issues they dealt with and with what achievements. And uh, the fourth research question, what does the role that does women played in international relations tell us about the Luxembourg society? Um, as methodology, because using uh, the oral history uh, method, um, we um, uh, used to, we choose this methodology first of all uh, to respond to a poverty of sources or a, a lack of systematic archive sources in the archive repositories, especially in Luxembourg, but also uh, worldwide uh, and in Europe. Uh, to uh, tackle uh, problems raised by GDPR issues and also by confidentiality issues that, uh, that are the files coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, <clears throat> also, uh, uh, in parallel with, with these methodological issues, uh, we identify some limitations due to the uh, tool of oral history uh, due to some unanswered, uh, unanswered interview requests, uh, to the fact that, that the content depends on what interviewees are willing to say, on the fact that verification are some, sometimes impossible because distanced in time, because uh, of the memory failures, uh, and the risk of falsification. So. Uh, the, the own uh, subjective story related uh, before the camera, and also uh, some difficulties in accessing data on the Luxembourg Diplomatic Corps related to this confidentiality um, uh, on, on uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs documents. In our project, we took as a theoretical basis the theory of international relations, the, th uh, the th history of women and gender, the uh, principle of the multilateralism and diplomacy after the Second World War, historical, political and socio-economic context of Luxembourg from 1945 uh, onwards, and also the, pla the place of women in the Luxembourgish society. 
on this uh, various angle of analysis, we add uh, the need to contextualization because uh, creating uh, oral history, we are crea creating new audiovisual objects which must uh, integrate the old audiovisual objects too. Uh, we took also uh, the perspective of memoir uh, and autobiographies. We took also uh, the contextualization through official documents, for sure the secondary literature, media sources and iconography, photography, cartoons and so on. What uh, has been done? So the project started uh, in, officially started in, uh, uh, in January 2022, but really started in December 2021. Uh, in this uh, constellation of the team with Francois uh, Klein, uh, myself and uh, my student and Sonia's student uh, from the Marek Alchmi, uh, who is now a uh, um, junior teacher uh, at, uh, at the Luxembourgish school, we realized for the moment six interviews. Colette Flesch in two sessions, Martin Reichert's uh, one session, Vivian Redding uh, one session, Erna Hennikot Schubscher's two sessions, Astrid Lulin one session, and Alet Consimius one session. These uh, six interviews are representing, are representing 20 second, 22 hours and uh, roughly 18 minutes of audiovisual recording. We ha you have here the picture of these ladies. All of uh, the interviewed, interviewed uh, ladies, all of them are pioneering women in the political and European institution domain, Vivian Reding and uh, Astrid Luling, uh, as uh, in, in the European commitment, Astrid Luling, who is uh, since 1952 committed for the uh, European ideal uh, in, in European institutions and in trade unions. I think uh, uh, it was mentioned uh, yesterday uh, in uh, Karin's uh, presentation and also in Simona's presentation. Anna Hennikot Schubscher's who was an uh, EP member, but also the first uh, um, lady president of the main party of the country, uh, uh, the CSV, and also the first lady president of the uh, uh, Luxembourgish unicameral parliament. You have um, uh, on the uh, second range, Arlette Consimios, the first uh, female diplomat uh, and the first female ambassador of Luxembourg, Colette Flesch, vice president, Prime Minister and the First Lady Bourgmest, the mayor of the capital of Luxembourg, and for sure Martin Reichertz, who comes as an expert and as a technocrat in this uh, female uh, uh, constellation. Related to the specific uh, angle of analysis of our uh, presentation from today, you have here two images of the Diplomatic Conference of Luxembourg in 1994 and uh, two days ago. So three decades uh, are uh, between the first and the second uh, picture. In the first one, you recognize Arlette Consimios as a, a single lady diplomat in 1994 as ambassador. And uh, in the second uh, picture, you recognize the current composition of the diplomatic uh, uh, corps of Luxembourg at the highest level, with almost 40% uh, women. Um, we established also a chronology, uh, what would be the most significant female figures in this uh, uh, diplomatic uh, chronology of, of Luxembourg, in this timeline. So the first one uh, was uh, Irene Heyerens, uh, who became private secretary, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Gaston Thorne, in 1969. So a lady in, in the uh, discreet range of, uh, of Gaston Thorne team. Then in 1970, 
th uh, three first women um, uh, uh, were, were to enter uh, uh, in the diplomatic uh, corps of Luxembourg, Jacqueline Ancel, Marie Rose Bernard Vormeringer, and Alet Consemius that you identify the figure in, in the previous slide. Then in 1993, Alet Consemius uh, was appointed as the first uh, woman ambassador to Luxembourg. She was appointed, uh, appointed to NATO. So uh, I think it's a symbolic uh, mo momentum in this uh, integration of uh, female uh, figures in uh, Luxembourgish diplomacy. Then uh, two years ago, uh, 2021, uh, Luxembourg's uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jean Nasselborn, announced the initiative of six states, uh, uh, including Luxembourg, aiming at pursuing a feminist foreign policy. And uh, nowadays, uh, of the 30 Luxembourg embassies in the world, seven women are uh, accredited as ambassador. 21.9% uh, uh, of, of this uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, diplomatic representation, and of the whole diplomatic corps, 39% of diplomats are women. <clears throat> Among these women, two are uh, really outstanding figures, Colette Flesch, I mentioned her before as Bourgmestre and Vice Prime Minister of, of the Luxembourgish government between 1979 and 1984, and more recently, Lydie Polfa, 1999-2004. Both of them are members of the Democratic Party, and both of them were um, Bourgmestre uh, Mayor of uh, Luxembourg City, uh, uh, which is also one of the three permanent capitals of European institutions. So um, the, these two, two, two ladies are very symbolic for Luxembourg, for women in diplomacy, and also for uh, the uh, Democratic Party uh, um, uh, appartenance. Uh, I would like now, but I don't know how to do this, to present you some excerpts of the interviews that we realized with uh, Astrid Luling, uh, Colette Flesch, uh, and Vivian Reding, talking about their condition as uh, ladies in, uh, in the political life. So, uh, is that Technique is not simple. So, tu peux le remettre en tente mm. otherwise you can send us the links if there's a link mm. and then we can just watch them at home <laughs> the interest is to be uh, Discussed together. So she uh, said that uh, when she um, uh, submitted uh, her um, um, request to uh, integrate the diplomatic corps. Uh, she was refused uh, because she was a woman. And the administration of the ministry precised her that she can't have such an ambition being a woman. 
uh, two decades, decades after she became prime minister and also vice prime minister. So uh, this was a nice uh, revenge uh, from Colette Flesch to the foreign, Luxembourgish Foreign Office. Uh, you have here uh, two excerpts of the interviews realized with Astrid Luling and Vivian Reding. Uh, we will try once again, but if not, I will uh, explain you how. Yes, we have a problem, and uh, Vivian told uh, yeah. uh, uh, President of the Commission n'avait pas très confiance dans, dans les jeunes femmes euh, me donner euh, des sujets de power l'éducation la jeunesse le sport euh, les médias so uh, uh, Vivian Redding uh, uh, share her experience as second uh, or second uh, category um, EP member and also um, uh, uh, European civil servant, especially as woman and especially as a Luxembourgish. Uh, and uh, here um, it's another um, uh, another um, um, part of the interview of Vivian Reading, which is put in perspective with uh, these two graphs concerning um, the, represent the, the female representation in the commissions and uh, in the uh, Luxembourgish unicameral parliament, and also um, in uh, the um, assembly, uh, in the uh, international parliamentary assemblies. And uh, what Vivian Reding said, that uh, always um, ladies uh, have a, a, a male mentor uh, helping uh, her to, to deal with their political or um, technical activities, it's uh, also uh, very interesting and um, um, also it's to, to be put uh, in relationship with this kind of, uh, of evolution of figures concerning the representation of, of women uh, in the political life. Now, what's next? Uh, we have a, um, a couple of interviews scheduled uh, this year uh, with you saw uh, on, on the other slide Lady Polfa, but also Simon Beisel, who was vice president of the Committee of Regions, uh, with uh, Madi Delvo, uh, one of the first uh, um, minister, female ministers, and also Anne Brasseur, who was president of the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Uh, these interviews are focused on uh, several topics, the role of women in the decision-making process and the, uh, in the implementation of Luxembourg's European and foreign policy, um, the uh, opening uh, of the diplomatic corps to women and the consolidation of their position in this um, masculine diplomatic corps, and also a special focus on women as ambassadors. 
So I thank you very much for your attention. I do apologize for the technical issues. Uh, and I look forward to get your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edina. Um, yes, we can take questions now. We group uh, questions at the end. Take questions now? Maybe, yes. Yes? If there are questions to this contribution. Yes? Yes. I think it's, it's, it's more a comment than, than a question. I think the one thing that struck me in all the presentations that I've listened to, including my, my, my own, is this need. I think in, in most of the presentations, there were pictures. And I think, and, and I recall when I approached the paper, one of the, thing, one of the first things that I was thinking is, what do they look like? But I think that also tells you that you, probably we wouldn't have the same impulse when dealing with leading men. And I think that also tells you, and you mentioned the Rutledge uh, uh, book on, on gender. And I think one of the things they're arguing is that we, may, we need to make these actors visible because they've been forgotten consciously, unconsciously, they've been rendered invisible. And I think part of what we're doing and what we want to do is to make them visible. And I think that in, in different forms and different ways that kind of appeared you know, in, all the, in all the papers. And I think also one of the things I was thinking yesterday and, and this morning is we actually need a project similar to the history of the institutions and that was imposed inter alia by the commission on these women um, because we know still very little and you know what we do now is a very incipient attempt to kind of of make the contribution of these of these women much uh, much more explicit and 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 rather advertise them so and and just very Quickly, I think I find that quite quite interesting, the male mentor issue, and I think that's also reflecting well on men, that you know, men are not just trying to prevent women, but there are some men who also consciously, actively try to promote female collaborator, and I think that's also, you know, shedding light on these female actors is also one way to kind of, you know, render justice to these probably fairly few men who have tried to actually advance. Um, so I think this is also something we need to, to, keep, uh, to keep in mind. I mean, the feminist foreign policy, I mean, how feminist is feminist? I mean, I was quite struck as one, one quarter. I mean, 20, or nearly 22% is not exactly mind-blowing if I miss it. So, so I would also, I mean, I, I appreciate the sort of, a, you know, slightly propaganda uh, agenda, uh, but I think we, as, as historians, we also need to be a bit, you know, take that with a pinch of salt uh, and not, not as best value, because what they want to do is one thing, what they actually are doing. Uh, and, and I was also wondering, perhaps you're not able to, I think this is a fascinating project, and one that is probably long overdue, not just in Luxembourg, but also in other countries. How does Luxembourg actually compare, and I'll come to my actual question, with, with other European uh, countries? I mean, maybe the smaller neighbors, but also perhaps the, uh, perhaps the larger one. I think what I'm, I'm aiming at is how much of a vanguard or you know, a leading country is, is Luxembourg. Is it, you know, emulating other wider trends in neighboring countries, or is it somewhat, you know, an agenda setter, so to speak? Um, so uh, concerning the images, um, we have the privilege to have an audiovisual presentation of the project, of the findings. So um, as I mentioned, also the iconographic uh, uh, elements, so the iconographical dimension, pictures, the image, are also part of this project. And through the image, uh, the pronounced word, uh, the figure of these of this ladies, we have the possibility to uh, present her uh, in a more striking way than a, a simple uh, analysis in a paper or in a, in a book. 
So this is also a good element of, of the um, digital um, media in, in presenting and publishing research projects. Now concerning uh, the feminist foreign policy, this is clearly <laughs> a political commitment. And uh, starting a feminist policy was uh, in the, uh, in the uh, program of the uh, uh, governmental coalition. So uh, I, we put it uh, in the chronology just to um, uh, view how uh, the uh, commitment of, uh, of uh, uh, the political powers evolved through, uh, through the time. Uh, now, Luxembourg is um, not very advanced, uh, advanced in uh, a comparison with other European countries because of uh, the dimension of the country, um, of the character, um, let's say, uh, conservative mm -hmm. of the country, the, the um, uh, promotion of uh, female in um, in, in, uh, at the forefront of the political uh, life uh, began in 19, began in, in a um, um, coherent way um, up to 1974 uh, when the Democratic uh, Party uh, was uh, uh, ruling the government, so Gaston Thorne and the Democratic Party and especially Thorne uh, uh, were committed to bring uh, female figures uh, uh, among the leaders of the party and then the, uh, among uh, the um, more uh, important uh, governmental figures. Uh, so uh, at that time, uh, Luxembourg uh, was not on, on the top of, of, this, uh, of this comparison. Uh, nevertheless, more recently, after uh, the... Um, uh, the, the uh, after the, the, the quotas adopted on a regular ba basis, female figures are constantly uh, brought um, in, uh, into, into the lights in politics, uh, in, in diplomatic activities, on parliamentary um, terms, uh, and so on. But this, this kind of uh, commitment of Luxembourg is quite recent. If I, if I may uh, add a word uh, as also uh, contributor to, the, to this project, um, if you speak about comparison uh, with other European uh, countries, uh, when Colette Flesch uh, becomes a Minister of Foreign Affairs in 1979, uh, there are no other uh, women uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in the European Union at this time. Uh, there are uh, other women uh, ministers of foreign affairs even before 1979, but not in the European Union. I think in this particular case, uh, it's not probably not because she's a woman, but because she was president of the, of the Democratic Party at the time. She was number two of the party behind uh, Gaston Thorn. Gaston Thorn went to the commission, and so she became number one of the party. And then uh, in Luxembourg, when you have a coalition, uh, in a governmental coalition, it's tradition that the number one of the, of the second party becomes Minister of Foreign Affairs. But for this time, it was quite a pioneer position in the European communities uh, in 79. Yeah? Are there other questions, perhaps, in the room or online, please? Something that Corinne said on uh, um, male mentoring, I find that yesterday Martina as well said, and you said um, in the presentation, that these women were more masculine than feminine, and the way that she dressed uh, also tried to indicate that female can have this type of jobs. I think that the fact that they were trained so much by men, and probably they we're trying to fit in in a type of experience and job experience where they didn't have any role model before themselves. So it was not really something that they did uh, voluntarily, but it was probably something that they learned. So I'm not sure if this is coming up in your interviews, but I think it would be interesting uh, to try to address uh, on 
uh, how they were seeing themselves because if you try to fit in in a type of environment where there's no one like you and uh, where you are the first one, you don't have role models and you are trained just by men, I don't think you don't have any other examples and you, you probably don't have the independence or the critical view on how you should behave or you should even dress <clears throat> in some specific uh, spaces, which is really interesting because it has been observed yesterday and came up again. But I think it's just because that's the only thing that they knew in a way. Yes, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, comment. Uh, if you watch the pictures uh, and also the yeah. interview, we all, you will see that all these ladies are particularly uh, careful with their uh, uh, physical uh, appearance with their brushing, yeah. uh, maquillage and, yeah. and dressing. Um, I think uh, it's uh, uh, maybe a specific dimension of, of women, but also as women in a masculine environment, um, they, uh, they wear um, uh, obliged to, to, to be uh, impeccable. So Astrid Luling tell uh, uh, it in, his, uh, in uh, her interview, uh, as um, Vivian Reding uh, also, uh, but the, um, in, in asking uh, the, the interviewees uh, how uh, they dealt with this masculine environment could be um, a, nice, uh, a nice perspective. Thank you. In, in one interview, Martin, Martin Reichert, who, who you saw uh, yesterday, and uh, you saw a little bit uh, her, her mindset, uh, she underlines in, in, one of, uh, in, in, in one interview, she was spokesperson of the, of the commission at the time in the 90s, and she, she underlines the work of appearance, look, coiffure, and uh, <coughs> jewelry. Uh, jewelry and makeup. Uh, which played a much more uh, important role than for men. She said to me directly during the interview, you have just to wear a coat and a tie, and for you it's okay. But uh, she underlines the hours spent for uh, appearance, uh, being a spokesperson of the commission, particularly for women. Yeah. Can I quickly follow up on the appearance? Because that's, that's my question, I think. The, the one image that popped into my mind when we talk about these issues is Edith Cresson, mm -hmm. when she was named prime minister a few, a, few, a few decades, a couple of decades or three decades ago, uh, because exactly she was judge or based on her appearance. I mean, they, I remember when I wasn't entirely socialized at the time, but I, I still remember and, and reading about it, how the media were commenting I mean, it's, it's Hillary Clinton as well, where, you know, the whole media was more interested in uh, how often she changed uh, a hairdress as opposed to the actual policy that she was trying to promote. So I think, especially when, you, when you're looking, I think perhaps when we look at, you know, women who were more in administrative jobs, then obviously the appearance and how women set themselves apart uh, as part of a strategy uh, uh, in a very male environment, but they're also judged because of that. So, you know, if a woman wears a dress or, you know, a, a, a power uh, 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 suit, you know, there will be comments on that. There will be comments on the jewelry. Uh, I also remember, I think, that was when, uh, oh, the name eludes me at the end of the European Central Bank, a French woman, I should know that. Christine Lagarde. Uh, Christine Lagarde. They also mentioned or, or commented on the jewelry. So I think this is also, I and mean, I think the reception uh, is also, I mean, perhaps obviously diplomats are a little bit less exposed than other political forces. But I think that would also be interesting in the interview to see how did this woman react? Because I mean, a lot of this is just purely sexist. Yeah, yeah, I mean, probably now journalists would watch their, uh, <laughs> watch their pen a little bit more closely because obviously Me Too uh, has uh, come and passed, uh, we're still there. Uh, so I think people probably self-censor themselves a little bit when they first put these sort of things to, 
paper, but I, obviously at the time that was just pretty much allowed. And, and you know, who has ever commented on how a, a male politician was dressed or uh, or the way he wore he wear, he wears his, his his hair? So I think this is you know, as a woman, you always have these sort of double standards. You know, you have to look feminine. But you will be judged because you look feminine, and then you know that would be taken. Is she really competent if she wears a short, a skirt, or a dress? So I think this is also one of the challenges that these women, I would assume, uh, uh, perhaps especially those with prominent political jobs, are also faced with. And I think that would be interesting to know how do they cope with that? How do they address these sort of challenges, which are pretty, very much unique to women? I'm pretty sure you would ask a man, you know, I wear a suit and, and, and a tie, and that's the end of it. I think the most common probably would get it, you know, whether he has a tie or no tie. Uh, I will uh, add a short comment, if the president permits me. So my comment, uh, two comments. One of uh, this is we have one question that was not... Uh, uh, has not uh, um, uh, be addressed in these interviews because some diplomatic corps like French, UK and Russia have uniforms, uh, male and female, they have the diplomatic corps uniform. And that then with a uniform, it's not a permission to have makeup, to have jewels and so on and uh, making uh, everyone at the same level through this uniform <coughs> permit to women uh, as uh, to, to men too, to uh, be uh, analyzed through their competences, work, and so on. My second comment, it's related to a project that uh, Francois um, is carrying on uh, with another colleague, Sou Souvenir and Ambassadeur. And in this, this project, uh, and in the interviews, they um, ask a question um, about the spouses of ambassadors, of women behind a powerful men, how uh, with this soft power of spouses of ambassador in organizing meetings, dinners, and so on, how these ladies are contributing to the development of uh, diplomatic relations between countries, personalities, and so on. Yes, perhaps a last the comment, short question. Comment yeah. to what you said about uh, men, they don't have, uh, about appearance, um, they don't have to care about their appearance. I, I don't think it's um, totally right to, to make on one side women with makeup, uh, airs, etc., because men, we judge them also on appearance. Uh, they look strong, they look powerful, they have hairs or not. Um, and they, they need to, to, to color the hair too. Uh, I think there, there is something else. Of course, the, the suit is, uh, is like a costume and uh, it may be close one part of the discussion, but they are also uh, judged uh, all the time on their appearance, and, but on other uh, boxes, not on uh, being beautiful and good looking, but uh, there are other aspects too. I think we don't have to forget that maybe. I, I, was, I wasn't saying we don't judge them. Yeah. I was saying they're not. The media doesn't discuss their appearance in the same way as women. Do you think? So? I don't know. I think they, they discuss the, their parents in another kind of appearance. No? Oh. Not to the extent no. that they do no. women. I don't know. In mind. But anyway, we can <laughs> <continue>. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> discussion of our coffee. Yeah. Dita, one last <laughs> comment, question. Yeah, my question was, uh, well, the appearance, I'm with uh, uh, Maud, so uh, I think it's, it's a topic that is uh, underestimated and we should look more into this. Also, we should look more into how women judge women uh, on their appearance. Um, now, I'm, I noticed um, that the, while it was going up, the, the ratio was going up, the percentage was going up the late 70s and, the, and has a peak in the mid 80s, then there is this... Uh, uh, in, in shoot, you know? And I saw that also yesterday. So apparently, the the first wave of uh, feminism um, had a had reached its peak in the big, mid 80s, and then there was a gap until the mid 90s, and then it goes up again. And now it goes straight up. Uh, even nowadays, you have uh, defense ministers, female, and you have 
president of the commission. So I'm wondering what happened there. Um, and uh, the last and the other point is that I think we should. Uh, it's it struck it struck me how far women themselves follow um, in this case the the, um, the talk of men. Uh, every time you hear a woman uh, in that position, she would talk about that sector of education and culture as being minor, of no importance, uh, and of irrelevance, so they basically taken into that field. Uh, while in fact, <clears throat> we all know, and we are in the educational sector, that obviously much more attention should be given to the educational sector. So um, I'm wondering how that, that goes along with, so that uh, do the women that go into that sector themselves then consider themselves minor and in a minor sector, or wouldn't that be an opportunity to in fact uh, go into a set, uh, to show that in the sector there are possibilities? And that exactly happened in the European integration process with Erasmus. So uh, the, the education sector is for most time the educate of the integration uh, a failure because nothing much happens and the education is difficult to integrate and uh, there is a lot of reluctancy. But then there comes this little thing up uh, with Erasmus and boom, it becomes the, the boom story uh, in the education sector. But obviously then uh, people struggle, who, who was the, who, who's the owner? And then you've got the commissioner, Marine, who's male. You've got the director general, Sutherland, who's male. And then you've got somewhere down in the hierarchy, you've got Mrs. Lastenews, who also claims you know, a certain ownership, but obviously can't get through. So I find that uh, quite interesting. Uh, element also in this discussion about education and maybe some some top stories how you can break through but then who who takes the ownership in the end uh, and why not uh, it, would it have been one of those uh, uh, important women uh, that took that uh, we saw in their hands thank you uh, i think we can continue the discussion uh, during the pause about this topic uh, because time is running by um, I have the pleasure to present uh, Katja Zeider. Uh, Katja Zeider, who is a senior lecturer in history and coordinator of the School of Humanities uh, Foundation at the University of uh, Westminster. Uh, you co edited uh, a book, uh, this published this year, with Brigitte Leucht and uh, Laurent Varlouzet, Reinventing Europe, the History of the European Union, 1945 to the Present. And today, uh, you will speak about Marian Camps and European integration. Thank you. You have the floor. Could I have the... Sure. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so my topic is Miriam Camps, um, who I am going to introduce you to. Um, my project, or my aim, eventually is to write a biography of her. Um, this paper is based on a couple of um, papers I've done around her scholarship, but also her role as a member of elite foreign policy think tanks in the UK and in the US. Um, Miriam Camps was uh, an American um, economist, diplomat, scholar um, and journalist. She was born in 1916, um, and I came across her a long, long time ago because she has written one book, she's written much more, but one book she's fairly famous for, and that's Britain and the European Community, 1955 to 1961. Uh, and this is kind of considered a classic of early European integration scholarship. And I always thought it's odd that there's this woman who published this in the early 60s, so 1964, I think it came, came out. And I also wondered, maybe it's a man, because the Anglo-Saxons have this uh, tendency to give names, like Lindsay, they, they apply to males and females. So, but no, it's a, it's a woman, and uh, actually she's um, published much, much more than uh, this one book. She's published on uh, more on European integration, uh, the free trade area negotiations very early on, transatlantic relations, um, the global economy, multilateral trade, the gap, um, and so on. She published over a long period of time. And then I discovered that she was also a diplomat. So she was um, in the State Department in the 40s and 50s um, and occupied roles where she designed European integration um, organizations. Um, 
So she hasn't really been considered by um, historians or uh, European integration scholars. Um, and I explore some of the reasons why I think that is um, in, in some of the work I'm doing on her. Um, and um, today, is that right? um, I, was, I, I want to introduce you to her, so her biography, and then um, also introduce you to or reflect a little bit on why a biography on camps is interesting and more than just you know writing her life you know what what can it tell us about women in diplomacy women in in scholarship and and think tanks so first of all um miriam camps i think i wanted a different slide miriam camps biography is um, characterized by crossing institutional boundaries. She never stayed for very long in one single position. And that's, I think, partly due to her being a woman. Uh, she um, had to leave the State Department in uh, 1954 because um, she got married. So the marriage bar meant she had to, to leave. And when she looked back at her career in the 1980s, she wrote something for her alumni organization at Mount Holyoke College, that's where she obtained her a degree in the 1930s, one of the elite women's colleges in, in the US. Uh, she reflects on this um, inside-outside life that she had. So she always wanted to be a diplomat, but she wasn't able to stay for very long in the in the State Department. So she says, my professional life has been a dual one, 15 years working for the US government and some 30 years writing articles on international problems on the outside. And I play a little bit with this inside-outside juxtaposition that she has. And I, I would argue that she remained a diplomat even though she was on the outside because she sought out roles and through her scholarship tried to remain active as a diplomat and an influence uh, foreign policy. So I think um, she is very modest uh, here, and um, she she obviously liked being inside. That was where she wanted to be. Um, but you can see that in the uh, in the sixties to eighties, she worked at Chatham House, uh, the um, elite foreign policy think tank in London, and the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Uh, another very prominent foreign policy think tank where a lot of people actually from the State Department move um, either in between or after their careers. She returned to the State Department in 1967 to 1970 <coughs> in a prominent position, which means that her role as a formal, in, formal and informal diplomat was recognized and she was able to lead the policy planning staff, which is the in-house think tank in the State Department. I also have an image of her <laughs> because, um, yeah, just put, a, put an image to, to the name. She looked like this from her student days to her <laughs> later years, so that was her battle uh, hair style. <laughs> yeah. um, so let me uh, start with, with her early career in the State Department and her role in uh, European integration organizations. So she um, joined the diplomatic service in 1943. She graduated in 1938, so there's a gap she, where she worked as an intern in various departments, but she had the aim of becoming a diplomat. And it worked because the US entered the war and positions were freed up and they basically went on a recruitment drive and employed many women, and she benefited from this, so she was able to join the State Department in 1943, and she was sent to London to the US Embassy, where she worked on sort of economic um, issues. Uh, she worked pretty soon, sort of 44, 45, on uh, European relief, um, economic relief and reconstruction. Um, and in early 1945, she joined the Secretariat of the Emergency Economic Committee for Europe, the EECE. So that was one of three um, 
uh, international relief organizations that were founded under the auspices of the United Nations, and it was her first experience working in an international organization. And as, a, as the secretary, or in the secretary, she was impartial, she was not representing the US, but she was kind of um, there to run the, the, the show. And there she also met prominent people like um, Wyndham White, who chat um, Gap later on. So she starts to network a lot during this, this period. Um, she then uh, was uh, very important in writing the terms of reference, so the organizational draft for the Economic Commission for Europe, an organization founded by the United Nations with a seat in Geneva. Um, so there she was the, the only woman really in the room with all the Russians and they pass around the vodka and she you know, um, drinks the vodka. But she said, well, I had a plan. I knew what I wanted from this. So I got through with my um, ideas. Um, all of this obviously is not acknowledged really. And the sec um, third organization she was involved in was the Marshall Plan and the OEC. Um, and much, much later in the 80s, um, there's one passage where you sense some frustration that her role was never acknowledged uh, in all of this and then all the histories of the Marshall Plan, they do go down in the hierarchy because she was a junior uh, officer, but um, while they mention many people, they don't mention her, like the history by Hogan, very um, uh, big volume on the Marshall Plan. So she says there were many fathers of the OEC, but there was only one mother referring to um, herself, and I think this is just to put her name there um, in in the 80s. Uh, she continued to work a little bit on the on the Schumann plan uh, in her role as uh, at the European desk in the State Department, but then she had to leave um, because she married a British uh, citizen. Her maiden name was actually Camp without the S, and her husband's name was Camps. So she said she she gained an S to her name, but she lost her job. <laughs> Got me. Right. So then she became a scholar. First of all, a journalist. She worked for the um, for the Economist uh, for two or three years, and then she um, started to um, publish on European integration, especially the free trade area negotiations, um, and. Um, she joined uh, Chatham House and the Council of Foreign Relations as one of probably the only people who uh, held joint appointments at both of these things. And that means she was really a transatlantic go-between. Chatham House was so pleased to have appointed her because they felt it would strengthen their links with the Council of Foreign Relations of the US uh, more generally. So her standing at the time was quite high. She was a recognized expert on European integration uh, in those years. Oh, there she is at the conference where she represents Chatham House. Um, she's there with Andrew Schoenfield, who was, I think, the director of Chatham House. Asa Briggs, who was at Sussex University, who founded the European Studies Department there. So she's right uh, in there, in the also the founding of the study area of European study. And that's just some of her, her publications. She wrote in a period where, especially in Britain, so she settled in Britain with her husband, where um, instant analysis on European integration were in high demand, both in Britain and the US. And so through this scholarship, uh, where she promoted herself by sending papers to policymakers, to people high up in the hierarchy, because what I hadn't mentioned is that she had established a vast network of contacts in Washington, in uh, London, in Brussels. So once she left the State Department, she had still had these contacts, and she would you know, post her, um, her papers and her books to people. And here I've got a letter from Jean Monnet <laughs> to Miriam Camps, thanking her for um, the book, uh, Britain and the European Community, uh, that she, she sent to him. So that's just one example of um, her um, actively um, putting out her, her scholarship. So 
my argument would be that scholarship and diplomacy were basically two sides of the same coin for her. So um, if I can't be in the State Department, I will be in the think tank, which is second best, but still good. And I will uh, continue to try and be, uh, be relevant. This also means, because she never had a position at a university until much, much later when she became a fellow at Cambridge because her husband worked there. She became a fellow there, I think, in the late 70s and 1980s. Uh, this means that her scholarship has often been labelled as journalism, especially by Oliver Datto and those um, scholars looking at, at her, which I think is um, kind of doesn't recognise how this, this field of European studies originated because there were people like Camps, Uwe Kitzinger, who had worked at the Council of Europe uh, in Strasbourg before becoming a professor at Oxford, Roy Price, who had been, I think, at the High Authority um, Information Service before he joined Sussex University. So they are not labelled as journalists, but it is Julian Camps who was labelled as a journalist because she had never had a classic university career or a classic diplomatic career, but she um, oscillated between, um, between these fields. Um, so what can a biography of camps contribute to wider scholarship on women um, in European integration, women and diplomacy? So I think camps biography can first of all um, allow us to reflect on women's career in international diplomacy, how women participated in diplomacy after the Second World War, uh, when paths to formal diplomacy were often still either blocked or restricted because when you got married you had to, you had to um, leave. So in that sense, I would argue that Camp's career was rather typical uh, for a woman who wanted to work in the field of diplomacy. Um, she was affected by the marriage bar, but she forged an alternative path, uh, path and oscillated between formal and informal uh, diplomacy. So um, this need to be flexible and making a virtue out of necessity meant that her career was much more varied and I would argue more interesting um, than that of her male counterparts. Secondly, uh, the project will allow us to explore Cam's role in designing post-war European integration organisations, and also to look at organisations such as the ECE, the um, Economic Commission for Europe, the OEC, that, that are not always in our uh, field of vision. We tend to sort of focus on um, the uh, EEC, ECSE, and, and so on. Um, so camps, she quite liked these intergovernmental organisations um, that, that she worked on. Um, also, her case shows how important networks are, um, also at the lower level. Um, and she forged contact with people who remained in the Foreign Service in the US, in, in Britain, who went up the ranks. So she had very high level uh, contacts. Um, that were useful for her and allowed her to play this role of um, somebody in the centre of, of this network and, and um, it informing and, and, and trading uh, information and ideas. Uh, also, um, it shows how junior um, members of staff were able to project their ideas and have an impact on, on these kinds of organisations. I think her case shows that um, uh, very nicely. Um, the other thing her biography, I think, allows us to do is to explore informal diplomacy or citizen diplomats, as they're set in the literature of, on this, and their role in shaping uh, international relations. Um, so CAMS, and I, I do that in... Uh, explore that in, in the paper. When she was at Chatham House, she set up study groups uh, to which she invited senior civil servants from the Foreign Office and the Treasury and also business and, and also from her network in, in Brussels. So it was a real meeting point for, uh, I mean, people like um, uh, some commissioners, uh, Kornstam, she uh, knew Max Kornstam well, uh, John Pinder, uh, they all met in her um, her um, seminars 
And uh, so she, she had a really good link into the Foreign Office. And with the empty chair crisis, uh, sort of the EEC crisis in 1965-66, she took on really the role of um, you know, trying to push a solution or a, a way for the British government to react to this crisis and try to push this idea. And the Foreign Office <coughs> picked it up. Um, so she, um, her papers are in the National Archives. Uh, this letter is by Sir Con O'Neill, who was a um, high-ranking civil servant, former ambassador of the UK to the communities who worked with camps and who uh, basically disseminated her idea uh, in the Foreign Office. And um, in this letter, he um, gives her credibility by saying who she is. I mean, she, she's well-known by many, maybe, but she, he says, if you don't know her, um, then he is this super expert on Britain and the European community, and we should listen to what she says, because that's good. And the foreign minister adopted these ideas. Uh, they were not presented to the foreign minister by accounts, but through uh, Con O'Neill and, and others, um, they were uh, adopted. But um, Wilson, the prime minister, didn't, <laughs> didn't go with it. But uh, she got very close to actually um, influencing the, the British position towards the empty chair crisis. Um, yeah, and then fourthly, um, I think there's great merit in reconsidering camp scholarship, as I've already said. She was one of the founders of this new academic field, European <coughs> Studies, and her background is rather typical uh, for scholars at the time who were not always full-time, um, purely uh, university-based scholars, but had other affiliations, had experience in these institutions they were writing about. Uh, so I think she needs to be put back in there as one of the founding mothers also of European studies um, as, as a field and also to consider her, and I've done that in a recent article, consider her contribution to European integration theory and, um, and, and the like. Right. And the final uh, quote by, by Miriam Camps when she got appointed as the vice chair of the policy planning staff, so returned to the, to the uh, State Department, she got interviewed in, uh, by the New York Times, uh, which is interesting because it links up with our discussion from the previous paper, that she was asked a lot about what she cooks for her husband and whether, what, what are her hobbies, and so, so they didn't really, they couldn't really cope with this woman <laughs> assessing this, this high-level role. But one thing that I got out of this was that she calls her, uh, she, well, she puts career in, in quotation marks, first of all, as the newspaper did. But she, she talks about the stereoscopic vision that she acquired and all these different positions that she had, and which she, she thinks is an advantage for the kind of work that she went on to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katja Zeider. Are there questions, comments? Yes, please. Thank you. I have a quick question. I think what I find quite interesting is that, like many other early scholars of European integration, she has this international, transnational experience that she leaves the US and then takes on positions or jobs in, in, in Europe. And I find that quite interesting. I was wondering if that's to some extent maybe a common denominator among many. I mean, Ernst Beas was also a refugee uh, uh, from, from Germany. And I, was, I think that's, there's, a, there's maybe something also to, to explore there, how these, this experience of Europe uh, also shapes the, these men or this woman in also not just taking an, an interest in what's happening uh, in, in Europe, but also to some extent, you know, trying to explain what and why that is happening. Just uh, something that popped into my mind. Yeah, I think that's, that's really a good observation. And I, I would agree that that's the case. You've got Haas, you've got Deutsch, you've got Stanley Hoffman, mm -hmm. even, who's also, I think, a uh, refugee. Um, and uh, can just move to the other side, but I think it's the direct experience and the uh, kind of urge to uh, wanting to know about Europe and explaining what's happening, either theorizing or describing 
um, that. So yeah, I think that's, that's true. And with Kitzinger and others, you have a direct experience also of the organizations and then you get into that that way. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Dieter? <clears throat> Yeah, it, it puzzles me always, um, and here we have another case of this, um, you drop out of your career in those days, the, the moment you get married. So uh, female workforce and female career being stopped at the moment that uh, you, you become uh, a housewife, basically. So, And um, it, uh, it struck me to find out, and this is a completely other story, it, it struck me to find out, find out that in my village, uh, which was heavily industrialized um, with textile uh, industries. The, even uh, up to my mother's generation, the, the girls, when they worked there, they had to sign a contract that they are not allowed to marry before the age of, I think, 24, 25. Um, so basically to keep the workforce, in that case, the female workforce, because textile industries, uh, as long as they could, uh, because they knew that they would automatically drop out the moment that they get married and would become housewives. So that's Germany, uh, southern Germany, uh, mid-20th uh, century. On the other hand, we, we talked about this uh, disappearance and the model of uh, women in career positions, which is basically a um, either a married woman but with no children or a single. And it is, this is still a reality today. And there are a lot of those uh, sociological uh, studies in, the, in that field. So basically, almost from that role model in those days that if I get married, I will drop out. So I don't get married if I want to have a career. Um, or I get married, but I will have not have children. So this complexity about the, the, the family. And this is still present today uh, in many of the mindsets. And it, it even came out yesterday with Ms. Reichert. She didn't have children. Uh, she, it was a decision, but um, it, it is, it is, a, uh, it is a, a topic uh, which uh, in, in the male world is not present. It's never been present, and uh, maybe now is coming more with, uh, with uh, since 10, 20 years, but before not. So in all these historical paths, uh, and uh, how far this determined, in fact, also then the role model that came later with the women that had a career. Uh, because many of them, in fact, were either single or married with no children. So I uh, mm. find that quite an, an, an interesting uh, factor here. Maybe I'll respond um, briefly. Yeah, um, I think in, in Cam's case, what was even worse that she married an alien, so not an American <laughs> citizen, which was for women even more of a problem, but she, I think she would have had to leave um, anyway, and they only changed it in the 70s. But she was allowed back, so I need to figure out a little bit why. Um, yeah, she didn't have children. Um, I don't think it was voluntary, but she, uh, it just didn't happen. Um, and she would never have been able to have the, the life, the career she had, because she flew across the Atlantic well, a couple of times a year. Uh, she spent long periods of time in New York, um, then back to, to London. Uh, so that wasn't that wasn't really an option. But her husband was um, a professor at Cambridge. So had they had children, she would have been. She we wouldn't talk about her from day to day. So it was pure chance. I think uh, that, that didn't happen. Sonia. Yeah, maybe just to that point, I'm I'm, I'm always thinking the more long delay, and I was still wondering. <clears throat> That's uh, always necessarily the case. I mean, I, I also I know that, that in, in Luxembourg, women who had were encouraged or strongly pushed out once they were married, but there, it was not a, a law except for civil servants, I think. But otherwise, it was more of a, a, an expectation, but still uh, class-related. I mean, there's some women who, who could put their kids in, in boarding schools and still have a social... <laughs> social life or could, uh, you know, if you think of uh, von der Leyen and so on, have a nanny and still have lots of children and, or, or wait till the children have a certain age and then really launch the career if you start early enough with the children. So I think it's, it's, it's a bit more, more complex maybe still, but it would be very interesting to see what exactly happened, um, especially in the 1950s, 60s, where I think there's a, uh, there, there are less women active than in the 1920s. Um, so, you know, this, this story is that you, you're surprised when you see someone like that in the 1960s, but actually there were quite a few women in history, hist in, in historiography, active in the 1920s, 30s, like ecologists and anthropologists and so on. 
And in the 50s and 60s, it became more exceptional. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah, just to put it in a maybe longer yeah. perspective. And her colleagues at, the, at Chatham House, and Chatham House was employing more women than maybe other institutions. There are also examples like Susan Strange, an economist, who um, just had a career later because she had three children. And then uh, she became a pro professor at LSE and she was at uh, Chatham House. So I think there are sort of different, different models, mm -hmm. but maybe with the travelings I wouldn't have quite worked for, <laughs> for her either. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think you're right that the 20s might have been a period where um, there were more opportunities for, for women that shrunk in the 50s when you wanted to return to the the wartime effects mm. of more traditional uh, lives. I think I think that's uh, an interesting yeah. observation. I can't really <laughs> generalize, no, but so I think it's interesting. Yeah. But I think in the 20s, and we have examples of women in diplomatic roles, women as, as scholars, um, uh, but often it's the men taking the credit that mm. were not treated very well. Um, they were exploited. I mean, uh, there's quite a lot of work coming out mm. on, on such women and diplomacy. They, they were not taken seriously at all. They were thinking, well, we can't send a woman there because <coughs> how does that look for us? So it's, yeah. it's really um, not the, the glorious 20s. And then the, uh, mm. So it's, it's very mixed. <laughs> There's also Pearl Mesta in Luxembourg, who's an interesting the US ambassador in Luxembourg uh -huh. in the 1940s, early 50s. Okay. Just an really interesting example as well. Perhaps one last comment, question? Yeah, uh, Elena. Yes, thank you. I have a collateral question. You mentioned that Miriam Kamps drafted a paper on uh, uh, the empty chair crisis. Um, I would like to know um, if uh, she uh, analyzed the Luxembourg Compromise or if she did something about Luxembourg. Ah, um, I'd have to look. She wrote a book. So in, in these papers, there were just a really policy advice and, and um, uh, not, not published. They were just... Um, you know, trying to maneuver behind the scenes, but she wrote a book after that, after the Luxembourg Compromise, um, um, the Green Book on the screen, which which I'd have to have a look whether whether she she must mention this, yes, um, but um, I think can't say in what terms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Um, we will now pass on the projection of one documentary film, which we can uh, prepare. Uh, <laughs> the title is Eliane Vogel-Polski, Champion of Women's Rights in Europe. And it was produced, and we have the authorization by Agnès Hubert uh, to project this film uh, today. Agnès Hubert is a recognized European expert on gender policy making. She was in charge of the EU gender equality policy in the 90s and continue to work uh, on gender issues for the European Commission as a member of the in-house think tank IDEA. She is currently professor at the College of Europe. She is the author of three books about l'Europe et les femmes, Identité en Mouvement, um, the European Union and gender equality. Um, and empowering people, driving change, social innovation in the European Union. Uh, and she produced this documentary we have, we are lucky to show you today. Eliane Vogel Polski, champion of women's rights in Europe. Oui, je travaille là Il n'y a pas de garder garde dans le... Oui. Est-ce que ça se fait une question euh, Non, je crois que c'est une question d'importance de la femme. Vous ne me dites pas si ça nous est dans le lavage maintenant, mais au rang de l'homme. En Belgique, il existe aujourd'hui encore de nombreuses inégalités 
entre hommes et femmes. En effet, hein, et la première inégalité, c'est les l'écart salarial. Pour une heure du travail, les femmes touchent 9% de salaire en moins, en moyenne par mois. Cela représente 63 euros brut de moins sur la fiche de paye des hommes, des femmes par rapport aux hommes. Chaque année, dans le monde entier, un grand nombre de se rassemblent et descendent dans la rue pour revendiquer leurs droits. Et l'une d'entre elles a joué un rôle pionnière en consacrant sa vie à progresser le droit des femmes en Europe, l'avocate belge Eliane Wokelbolski. La situation des femmes dans le monde du travail, pour moi, ce sont vraiment les femmes au pied de Exactement comme étaient les femmes dans l'Axie de Chine. Elles ne sont pas en mesure, en effet, de marcher comme marchent les hommes. Il est extrêmement visionnaire. C'était une femme engagée, généreuse. Dans l'article 119, on disait, ah oui, ça c'est l'article d'Eliane. Ma grand-mère est morte il y a approximativement 10 mois. Quand on est dans son appartement, on discutait, elle me parlait de son enfance, de son adolescence. Son adolescence, c'était pendant la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Elle m'a raconté plusieurs histoires. Donc une qui m'a marquée, c'est quand euh, elle s'apprêtait à rejoindre ses parents euh, pour un week-end qui habitait à la campagne. Et puis elle voulait appeler faux papiers. Donc au lieu de s'appeler Polski, euh, sur ses papiers était marqué qu'elle s'appelait Paulet, parce que c'était euh, des éléments juifs. Et elle s'aperçoit qu'il y a euh, un contrôle de papiers de, de soldats. Justement, et donc, donc il prenait les identités, il demandait aux gens leur identité. Et, et très, très. Puis je me suis rendu compte après, à son enterrement, quand j'ai vu tout le monde qui avait des les discours qu'il y a eu, quand on en parlait aussi, quand on disait, mais la grand-mère, quelle, quelle grande dame. Je trouvais ça génial de dire quelque chose comme ça. Après son décès en 2015, le journal Le Monde écrit Il y a Défenseur convaincu du groupe social, l'avocat de s'est tout au long de sa carrière pour faire progresser le droit des femmes. Elle est née dans cette maison de Gang, le 5 juillet 1926. Ses deux parents sont d'origine russe. Ils s'installent en Belgique, première guerre mondiale. Modernes, cultivés, ils sont sociaux et une excellente éducation à leur deux filles, Marie-Françoise et Elie. Au sujet de son père, Eliane disait « Mon père était un fait en matière d'égalité. Lorsque nous demandions à quel de nous il préférait, il répondait à Marie-Françoise « Tu es la préférée de mes fils aînés. » Et à moi, « Tu es la préférée de mes filles aînées. » Après ses études secondaires chez le Sotidictine, Eliane Polsky s'inscrit à l'université en droit. Parce que c'est plus sérieux que la philosophie, cela ne l'a pas. Le 16 juillet 1950, elle sera une rare femme de son époque, tenir un doctorat avec grande distinction à l'Université libre de Bruxelles. Son talent, clé des découvertes, son souci d'améliorer la condition des ouvrières et sa passion pour l'Europe en construction feront d'elle une pionnière qui va transformer le droit à l'égalité en Europe. Quand on est le temps des constats, il est dépassé. Je crois qu'il y a des personnes qui contestent toute une série de situations, le sous-emploi, la basse qualification, euh, les, les, les difficultés de promotion, euh, les, les bas au niveau des salaires, etc., le clivage des métiers. Mais comment changer les choses Elle avait travaillé avec des, avec des hommes politiques, elle connaissait bien les institutions, elle pouvait beaucoup aider euh, les femmes de l'époque. Euh, à transformer leur révolte en des actions tout à fait pertinentes devant des tribunaux. En 1957, les chefs d'État et de gouvernement des six pays fondateurs de notre Europe se retrouvent à Rome. L'objectif rédiger un traité d'union économique et sociale. La communauté économique européenne est ainsi créée. La France insistera pour introduire une clause d'égalité des salaires entre les hommes et les femmes. C'est la première fois que ce principe dans un texte européen. Il s'agit de l'article 119 qui énonce que chaque État membre assure l'application du principe de l'égalité des rémunérations 
entre les travailleurs masculins et les travailleurs féminins pour un même travail. Lors du passage à la deuxième étape de l'intégration en 1961, les ministres européens constatent qu'au niveau de chiffre, l'article 219 ne peut être attrapé. Tiens, Eliane déclare, cette violation des droits communautaires a été une grande leçon. C'est à partir de là que j'ai compris qu'il fallait un changement juridique et de temps total pour arriver changer la résistance et les différences de la société à la question de l'égalité des femmes et des hommes. À l'époque, j'ai commencé à m'occuper, si je puis dire, de l'égalité des salaires. Euh, L'écart moyen était de 30 à 15 Donc, ça n'était pas. Je dirais qu'on n'a pas rattrapé tellement cet écart. Alors, je crois qu'il est impossible de parler des inégalités de salaire comme ça, en, en s'imaginant euh, qu'il s'agit simplement du salaire. Le salaire fait partie de tout le contexte, de tout le contexte sociologique, de tout le contexte social, de tout le contexte familial, qui surtout, et là on en revient à l'image, à la dévalorisation systématique du travail accompli par les femmes. Pour le même salaire, je ne veux pas faire leur travail. Au cours d'une semaine de formation syndicale, Kélia Vogelboski anime en septembre 1965, elle explique l'article 119 du traité de droit aux ouvrières. Ce sont deux d'entre elles qui mèneront quelques mois plus tard la longue grève des femmes machines. Elia, au barreau Bruxelles, dira « Je me suis rendu compte à ça, le droit était un outil qui pouvait véritablement servir une Ce fut mon révélateur personnel qui m'a mené au féminisme. » Est-ce que tu imagines que 33 enfants ont bloqué toute une équipe dans 3 mois Nous pas nous pas Femme jolie qui s'est dirigée par une femme remarquable qui s'appelait Marie-Lise Ernst Orion. Elle a fait une femme qui s'appelait sa avocate, un soir, sous sa mère chez elle. Et Hélène Vogel-Polski est là, je ne pas du tout. Elle nous a expliqué de manière mais extraordinairement forte son expérience à la Fabrique nationale d'arrêt de guerre à Erstal. Elle a dit que c'était ce qu'elle voulait, mais vraiment, elle a pu utiliser les outils pour se poser l'imaginaire. Dans la mesure où il y avait cette disposition sur l'égalité salariale dans le traité de Rome, il ne faut pas passer à côté et que ça peut aussi servir à la lutte des ouvriers. L'une des syndicalistes qui avait déjà assisté au séminaire Bélian sur les droits des ouvrières est Charlotte Augustin. Elle sera preneuse de la grande grève de 1966. Que disait le traité de Rome en 1919 Ça disait quoi il était marqué, hein, parce qu'il disait ah, « ah, 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 Et on a toujours joué sur ça, parce qu'un ah, travail égal, ah, il n'avait pas de ah, 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 Quand on a fait le traité, la femme magique gagnait avec le pauvre malheureux qui balayait la cour. Hein. Alors qu'elle est tenue à faire une fonction, qu'elle travaillait avec le public. Et ces femmes fâchées, c'est une situation ouais, ouais, ouais. Mais inimaginable. Les femmes qui travaillent dans des conditions simples, sur un truc sur des sens, travaillent avec un travail d'une difficulté, d'une crise extrême, la femme évidemment des heureux hommes à l'époque, et ces femmes ont décidé de cacher la grève. C'est une femme machine, c'est une femme machine. C'est une femme machine, si tu veux. Chose. Et à qui qui. C'est vraiment que la situation de cette espèce de fond, indépendamment du salaire, de travailler dans le crâne de lui et, et tout ça, c'est insupportable. Et donc d'être l'aide, de ne pas pouvoir être ce qu'elle veut faire en réalité, des petites femmes. Et là, ce n'est pas ça que je veux Ça, ça, c'est une vérité de grève aussi. Jusqu'à ce qu'on on a toujours considéré la femme comme un préférieur. Ils ont de même pu porter nos camarades, mais je ne veux faire de la personne. 
il y en avait beaucoup parmi eux qui ne prenaient pas conscience du rôle de la femme dans la société. Je pense que quand il y a des travailleurs, il n'y a pas d'hommes, il n'y a pas de femmes, il y a des travailleurs. Ça place dans la société, ça place dans l'industrie. Elle venait vraiment avec deux choses. D'une part, voir leur salaire progresser et la notion d'égalité et la puissance de ce qui est bien à point pour étayer une revendication sociale. Et elle voulait aussi nous enfermer dans une profession publique. Même si la classe n'a pas obtenu l'égalité salariale, ils ont entendu une augmentation de salaire, mais c'est une augmentation qui ne compense pas l'écart entre les deux. Je crois que ça va être un peu plus important. Après, les reines, même si c'est comme ça, il y a eu plus de luxe. Cher Jamie, vous avez fait votre avis dynamique et concret, un bon jouvent de promis, d'espérance. Non seulement pour les travailleuses et la classe ouvrière belle, pour nous aussi en France, mais pour tous les travailleuses, pour les classes ouvrières des filles du marché. Vive plus des travailleuses de la Vive Vive plus de travailleurs Plus de chemin à dire comme ça entre les organisations syndicales et les travailleurs des six pays du marché commun. À l'issue de cette semaine, Eliane recherche un cas porté devant la Cour européenne. À la FF, Sanita refuse de soutenir d'éventuelles plaignantes pour ne pas remettre en cause le cadre de leur négociation collective. C'est alors qu'on se présente au cas Gabriel Ophren, une hôtesse de 40 ans, licenciée. Ça Alors là, nous devons vérifier la de la terre, si tout est bien rangé, si tout est propre, si le manque bien, exactement. Vous êtes la première à y monter combien de temps l'heure de vol Un quart d'heure avant le départ. Lors de cette France, Eliane saisit l'occasion de produire une action, l'application de l'article 119, qui ciblait la discrimination. C'est qui a introduit une préoccupation du droit européen qu'elle a utilisé, qu'elle a euh, utilisé comme une source forte. Donc elle a fait ça un peu sur toute la cette session de la vente. C'est quand même assez, assez extraordinaire. Le 8 avril 1976, après deux procès et huit ans à Paris, la Cour de justice de la communauté européenne rend un arrêt historique dans le cas de Non seulement. L'article 119 devient directement invocable par les juridictions nationales, mais l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes est le fondement du droit européen. C'est un immense succès. Mais pour elle, la lutte continue. Évidemment, on se très différent, mais ça se caractérise par des inégalités dans le dans la formation. Bon, bah, alors s'il y a une égalité dans l'éducation et la formation, il est clair que cela opère les changements. Ça veut dire qu'au moment euh, où il y a ségrégation, au moment de l'entrée dans le travail, vous trouvez des ségrégations très importantes dans le monde du travail pour les postes de travail occupés ou réellement aux femmes, euh, pour les fonctions occupées, il y a une dans le secteur d'activité, où les activités sont beaucoup plus occupées par les hommes que par les femmes, et de même qu'on peut voir que quand un métier féministe, on automatiquement également. Et vous avez sur une répartition tout à fait la carrière des hommes est enfin, toujours beaucoup plus c'est la carrière des femmes et les résultats et la salaire est moins que la des hommes. Et il y a une autre question à la cour. Comment on fait pour la traduire dans l'économie réelle Je crois que la première chose est que les deux partenaires sociaux sont d'accord sur quelque chose. Parce que si eux ne sont pas d'accord, ou euh, l'entente sociale est tellement importante, et aussi en Europe, alors on n'arrive pas à une solution. Deuxièmement, j'ai demandé, et là on a besoin des syndicats, de revoir les, les, la classification des fonctions. Ça a duré du temps, mais à un certain moment, on l'a quand même introduit dans l'accord interprétationnel. Mais des fois, 
l'idée que c'est après 3h30 de discussion dans un climat très positif, nous voulons que le représentant du gouvernement et de partenaires sociaux se sont mis d'accord sur une déclaration commune. Les représentants patronaux et les représentants des travailleurs sont d'accord pour dire que la consultation doit déboucher sur un contrat d'avenir. En fait. Dans les années 90, Eliane Gallo, que l'on ne le sera pas sur le terrain de l'égalité professionnelle, si l'on ne donne pas de place dans la sphère politique. Et je l'ai introduit à un certain moment, et je n'étais pas la seule, parce que l'idée des États existait. Je suis pas la seule qui a ça. Mais je l'ai introduit euh, au Conseil des ministres. Et euh, qui était premier à ce moment-là, me disait « va parler avec euh, les chefs de groupe au Parlement ». J'ai dit « je veux vous dire à la fête, sur ce moment, ils ont écouté deux, une fois de leur groupe ». Et alors, les groupes, certains me disaient, mais si tu comprends ça, pourquoi est-ce qu'on ne pas les coûts pour les handicapés, pour les homosexuels, etc. Et, euh, j'ai dit, il y a deux groupes de base, la société, les femmes et les hommes, et pour le reste, ce sont des, des filles. Donc, euh, si je demande un quota, parce que les femmes sont un groupe de base, on a pour le moment 40% de femmes au Parlement. C'est bien. Mm. Mais enfin, oui. c'est pas mal. Si cet équilibre entre femmes et hommes dans la sphère politique progresse en Europe, c'est notamment à Eliane Vogelpolski qu'on le doit. En 1992, elle rejoint le réseau européen Femmes et prise de décision qui s'empare du concept nouveau de démocratie paritaire. C'est à elle que fut organisée la première manifestation du réseau, un grand sommet européen sur les femmes et le pouvoir. Venue de toute l'Europe, du nord au sud, c'était là. Ministre, terre, une actrice devenue ministre de la Culture, présidente du Parlement européen, une ex-chef du gouvernement, une commissaire convaincue qu'il n'y avait pas assez de femmes en politique, il fallait y être. Et la conférence d'Athènes a eu un impact considérable. Euh, elle n'est pas considérable parce qu'elle s'est achevée sur ce qu'on appelle la déclaration d'Athènes, qui a été euh, signée par un certain nombre de femmes à pouvoir. Même ces femmes, en leur demandant de signer ensemble une déclaration, elles vont tout de même décider d'engager le gouvernement, puisqu'elles sont en exercice. Et donc, euh, il est clair que les responsables vont pas signer la quoi. La déclaration d'Athènes était surtout gérée la déclaration d'ordre idéologique. La déclaration d'Athènes était parce que les femmes représentent plus de la moitié de la population. La démocratie impose la parité dans la représentation. Le mot était laqué. En effet, les discussions furent passionnées lors de ce sommet. Dans le travail économique, Vie politique, la parité s'imposait comme une évidence pour une démocratie vivante. Et nous apportons donc à la vie politique un, un plus. Et ceci, nous, les unes et les autres, nous, nous regrettons euh, de ne pouvoir euh, le développer davantage, de ne pouvoir euh, affirmer davantage euh, cette, euh, euh, certaines valeurs qui sont les valeurs féminines. Et nous pensons que nous pourrions euh, améliorer. Euh, euh, la vie quotidienne, les conditions de, de gestion de la société, si on nous si on est bien. Je me rappelle que je parlais de, on, on parlait de ça avec Yann Vogel il y a quelques années, et elle me disait toujours, toujours, elle parlait de la Belgique. Et, et vous savez, en Belgique, on est un pays avec une structure, plus ou moins d'égalité. Il me disait, dans notre constitution, il y a des articles qui finissent très bien comment euh, doivent se, se partager, comment les vivre les communautés. En particulier, nous avons un article dans la Constitution qui dit que le doit être déposé pour moitié de francophones, moitié de francophones, le Premier ministre non pour des Et on s'est dit, mais pour le faire aussi, pour les les femmes, on a dit que j'ai fait une sans comporter du de la Constitution. Mais, mais je crois qu'on peut y arriver. Et, 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 et c'est juste, juste. Ce, ce sont des elles-mêmes, c'est beaucoup plus. C'est d'abord de manière volontariste d'imposer une, égal, une égalité politique, une égalité surtout dans la participation à la prise de décision à tous les niveaux entre hommes et femmes. C'est aussi dès que à travers cela, 
il va y avoir une zone négociation de ce qu'il y a 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 de Force des conclusions du sommet d'Athènes, elle a introduit des démocraties paritaires dans la notion de citoyenneté. La seule solution, c'est vraiment de donner aux femmes, via le droit fondamental de l'égalité et via la démocratie paritaire, un véritable pouvoir de décision pour le projet politique européen, qu'elle soit dans toutes les instances, politique d'abord, mais pas seulement économique aussi. En fait, les femmes représentent 50% des ministres, 44% des parlementaires, 48% des élus régionaux et 41% des conseillers ministres. Au Parlement, la présidence et plusieurs autres postes de responsabilité sont confiés à qui Néanmoins, le secteur, le secteur budgétaire et financier, comprennent une majorité d'hommes. Belges qui travaillent, travaillent à temps partiel. 
Et ça veut dire une chose, c'est qu'elles gagnent moins, moins, ce qui est normal, qu'elles gagnent en fonction de leur temps de travail, mais c'est pour tout leur droit de prestation sociale, que ce soit en chômage, en maladie ou en pension, et là c'est là que c'est le plus grave, sont tout à fait euh, rabotées parce qu'on applique des fonctionnalités bien souvent. Et donc elles ne se rendent pas compte au début de leur vie ou durant leur vie professionnelle qu'elles sont en train de se, de se construire une vie de pauvreté ou une fin de vie de pauvreté. Et j'aimais bien une position qu'Eliane Vogel avait, elle disait mon boulot c'était un boulot de juriste et donc l'accès à la justice a du sens pour moi dans ce domaine-là. Dans la crise économique ou la crise que nous vivons, on sent très bien que les droits fondamentaux sont en péril. Et surtout pour les femmes, l'accès à la justice est une manière de lutter contre l'extrême pauvreté. Parce que si on n'a pas accès aux droits, eh bien on rentre dans une spirale euh, de, de, de précarisation euh, qui fait en sorte que, eh bien, on est encore dans une situation plus pauvre. Et là, il y a vraiment quelque chose moi, qui, me, qui, me, qui me préoccupe aujourd'hui et qui, je suis sûre que si Eliane était là, elle dirait ça, c'est vraiment un domaine, un combat qu'il faut mener. L'intégration euh, du genre dans tous les domaines euh, de la vie économique, politique, sociale, etc., ça ne se décrète pas, ça s'apprend. Et ce que euh, Eliane Vogel avait très très bien compris, c'est que le territoire local pouvait être euh, un endroit où on pouvait voir dans le budget euh, ce qui allait aux femmes, ce qui allait euh, aux hommes. Un exemple très simple, je me souviens avoir été en, en, en Suède euh, pour voir comment ça fonctionnait, euh, l'exemple le plus simple c'était le sport. Euh, dans quel euh, sport majoritairement va le budget euh, de la ville ou le budget de l'État, et en l'occurrence le budget de la ville Eh bien c'était pour le foot masculin. Euh, alors que euh, pour les filles, il y avait un peu de l'argent pour la, pour la danse, mais il n'y avait pas d'argent pour le foot féminin, euh, parce qu'on considérait que c'était le foot masculin qui, euh, qui, qui, qui l'emportait. Enormous interest among men today to actually take more responsibility and also to stay at home. I did that myself with my second child. I took a half year leave, uh, which was very good for me, good for my children. And also good for the surroundings to learn that also men have to do this. I actually became a better politician when I got children. And uh, I would have hard time probably understanding a lot of problems in society if, if I was not a parent. Traditionally, men have been um, uh, very aggressive. They have been part of a patriarchy and so on. And I think we have to change this role in order to, to uh, get a new society. Cette idée de démocratie paritaire, elle dit que c'est évidemment une utopie, mais en même temps elle y croit, toujours elle est utopique et pragmatique. Elle a toujours été comme ça, et elle arrive toujours à concilier les deux. Et ben, c'est quand même une utopie qui, a, qui est devenue assez concrète. Ça a donné des tas de résultats. Il y a eu des gouvernements paritaires bon, qui n'ont jamais été fort durables, il faut bien le reconnaître, mais quand même en Suède, de, en Espagne donc je veux dire, alors qu'on avait des tas d'opposition en disant mais c'est complètement fou finalement ça a donné ça a donné des résultats relativement rapidement et ça a fait considérablement progresser la représentation des femmes dans les organes de décision politique ça c'est incontestable donc ça aurait réjoui Eliane à mon avis c'est clairement une figure euh, féminine importante j'ai une idée précise de ce qu'elle a pu réaliser. C'est possible d'avoir des résultats quand on se bat pour l'égalité homme-femme et c'est pas un combat perdu. So, yes, thank you. Uh, we thank uh, Agnès Hubert uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity to, to, to present this movie. She couldn't be there uh, today, but I think uh, this uh, documentary about uh, Jan uh, Fogel Polski uh, is a very rich uh, source of information uh, about how to use the law as a tool for equality. Uh, the birth of parity democracy, there are a lot of topics being utopian uh, and pragmatic 
um, a lot of topics uh, w I invite you to discuss during the coffee break because we are already uh, late. We will resume at 11 o'clock for those who are online. I thank again Katia Weider and Elena Danescu and uh, Agnès Hubert. And uh, well, see you at 11. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the people online. Uh, we will resume uh, the uh, It's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you Mauve Carbonet, Jean Monnet Cher, lecturer in history at Aix Marseille University, president of the TETIS Consortium of Euro Mediterranean Universities. Director of the European and International Studies Master's degree, researcher at the UMR TEDEM. She is also for Ex Marseille, coordinator of the International Erasmus Mundus Master's degree, South European Studies, Eurosud. And her work focuses on the European communities in their early days, as well as on the industrial and environmental history of Europe and the Mediterranean in the 20th century. Mauve Carbonel. You have the floor. Thank you. Je dois ouvrir. Oui, c'est bon. C'est bon. Okay. Thank you. Point. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's to be here back in Luxembourg, and especially in this kind of conference, my seminar with a lot of women around the table and some colleagues. So very pleased to be here. Um, well, it was a very interesting exercise, uh, you asked me, even if you did not ask specifically a topic. Uh, I was interested in questioning my former research. Uh, now time, time is passing, and 20 years after the beginning of my uh, research career, Uh, I was interested in questioning uh, my research itself, but also uh, who I was as a young researcher in this uh, field. So it's always a bit strange because something uh, appeared at, uh, 20 years later that well, seemed to be obvious, but they were not at that time. Um, and, um, well, The first part of my research career was dedicated to European integration history. I have, of course, still a lot of interest in European integration history. I teach European integration history. I run this master's degree in European studies. I also have published recently, um, uh, I commented, uh, commented memoirs of a French diplomat last year. And, um, but I have reoriented recently my main research project on industrial history. Um, and when I look back uh, 20 years ago, I can see a kind of gap um, between my research, the way I did it, the way I, understand it, I understood it, and uh, the European um, the orientation of the uh, research in European integration history nowadays. And It's a living process, and uh, of course, that's great. Uh, first, I must point, I, uh, point out the context of my initial research. I completed a PhD on the members of the high authority of the European Coal and Steel community, and this is uh, an important piece for me. Uh, at a time when the European integration historians starting to show strong interest Uh, in the people, in the human aspect of the European integration process. Not only on the main figures, uh, and it was one of our tasks, this new generation at that time, uh, to go beyond um, the main figures, the dominant uh, founding fathers. Mm? All people were in the shadow uh, of uh, these founding fathers. Um, Many works uh, have emerged on the European elites, uh, the administration, institutions, and their management, uh, from the Commission to the court, court of Justice. And my research was part of this tendency, to work on the human material of this history. 
I did also further research on uh, high officials from Luxembourg with the same approach. Well, my approach was more uh, qualitative using the biographical method to understand who ran uh, the first community. Pathway, family history, education, political career, professional career in some cases, conceptions, ideas, with the aim at the end of portraying the human uh, management of the community. I learned a lot from this approach. And when I think back to my uh, years as PhD student, that I was, <coughs> the very beginning of my research, it seemed to me quite normal, even obvious, when I was working on the European elites of the 50s, that I was going to work on men, only on men. I did not even think uh, about women uh, as part of my research. Political power in the 20th century was men's affair, very rare women in general, anyway, any in my eyes. I grew up in the 80s and in 90s, and women of power were rare anyway, in the press, in the TV, around me at all levels. Certainly, uh, before starting my research, uh, I could name maybe just five uh, female politicians. Hmm? Margaret Thatcher, Edith Cresson, uh, Simone Weil, few socialist ministers from the 90s, uh, and I think that was all. Hmm? So, in all cases, there were exceptions. So, working on the history of the, Europe, uh, the political power of the European communities was uh, working on men. It was normal to work on male politicians. And I could not expect uh, a women in my research. And I didn't think even of, um, about their absence, about their invisibility. It wasn't, there were men, only men, and that was normal. Maybe another point about during this time of research, uh, initial <laughs> research, there was also this um, position uh, of student. A young woman, I was 20 years old, working, writing history of men of a certain age, to be polite. <laughs> um, I met several uh, witnesses, close collaborators, most of them men, including one former member of the High Authority of the European Coal and Steel Community, who was alive. And this has <coughs> led, uh, I'm sure about that, of a kind of unbalanced situation. Maybe a BA uh, in the dialogue with the witnesses, men used the position of power, and me, female student, used the positions <coughs> of domination. In my, as a female student with strong male professors. But anyway, I cannot go further in that uh, reflection because, well, maybe it's personal, it, be, it belongs to uh, it, uh, all of us. The results of the research were strong at the end, and there was also these very strong and false limits. And this point appears clearly now, this unfalls limit. Um, I did not search for women because I could not imagine to find them at this place in, this, in the history. Few years later, during my research, maybe I, at the end, I think, if I remember, I realized one day the women were absent from my work. Well, it was normal for a few years before, and then one day suddenly, say, there is no women at all. I realized the absence. It was a kind of shock. It was an awareness of my own barriers or my own unfold uh, limits uh, I was talking about. And what made me realize the, that point was the meeting of many female witnesses, young colleagues, uh, historians, Katya and others, uh, 
uh, some uh, figures of professors. We had few. We were talking about that at the coffee break. Marie Therese Beach and, uh, and some, some others, but not many. Uh, especially in European integration history, marked by uh, very strong uh, economic history, business history, with a lot of uh, uh, male professors. So I was working with a lot of women all around me, students, archivists, also many female archivists uh, in all places in Europe, uh, witnesses, and I realized I was writing a male history with women. That was a kind of paradox. Well, it was the, to introduce the, the context of uh, my reflection. And um, on this uh, reflection emerged also um, from this report uh, a reflection about the gender of the community. And for me, and, uh, I was talking about the, the image, the representation I had about the, the first communities. This is it, this picture, this picture, the high authority of the European Council community. Ah. One day, someone said, they look all the same. Especially, well, it's a black and white picture, of course, it doesn't help, but uh, some of them are really similar. This black and white image of men, most of whom no longer very young, dark suits and ties, reflects the early years of children integration. I was working off men of that type. And the European integration history was born from these men. The European and Steel community was a world of men in three-piece suits. That's the title of my intervention today. It was certain. No? Between 52 and 67, 19 men, only men. We could say the same for the European Commission, only men from 58 to, 19, uh, to 99. 89. <coughs> so at, the first glance, at first glance, the gender of the first European communities uh, e, e, C, S, C, or E, C, is clearly a masculine. Community institutions run by men, especially in the case of the first community, in charge of uh, male industrial sectors, coal and steel industries. All figures are of the same kind, except for uh, the employees, uh, secretary interpreters, uh, I have here uh, the, the list of uh, main chiefs of staff, only men again for everyone. The same for the uh, uh, director general, the deputy the director generals, only men. And at one moment of my research, I was interesting of, uh, um, interested in representations, images, discourses, and symbols. Mm -hmm. The new institutions were seeking legitimacy. And, you know, strange in this man's world, the, the symbol of motherhood uh, appeared in the discourses of many actors. Finally, I couldn't find a female representation in this history. Of course, it was a metaphor, but it was already something. The European uh, coal and steel community was described as the mother of the EEC and more generally of the European Union. A virtuous mother run by perfect Europeans, by pioneers, boosted by founding fathers. The stereotype of the European high officials was born <laughs> during this year. The picture of the man, the man we had here, and uh, uh, some uh, adjectives, some stereotypes linked to this man, pro-European from the beginning, democrat, technocrat probably, but for the common good. It was the, the stereotype. But symbols were something. It was not enough if the European coal and steel community, community is the mother, EEC and EU, the daughters, uh, were the real women mm, in the European integration history. 
I told you they were totally absent in my eyes at the beginning of my research. And uh, I finally realized a few years later that they exist. And they exist, they were strong and present, but not in a visible way. And I have two points. First, wives, mothers, and European identity, and the, the role of uh, wives. The figure of women, the, the historian uh, meets, well, I met uh, in the early years, uh, uh, working on the early years of the European integration history, um, and working like me on biographical aspects, is first of all, the wives. They are, in general, absent from the public archives, but they appear in some of the administrative archives when it's about family affairs, about pensions, about uh, um, children, about travels, about moves. They are also mentioned in the testimonies as the, by the male actors themselves, it can be oral or written. Uh, and wives appear all, uh, in discourses when it's about family, about other personal relations, interpersonal relations among wives and families, uh, outside work, uh, education of the children, social and religious life. Wives are important here, but invisible. This are standing next to their husbands, on pictures, here uh, Marie-Thérèse Giacchero. Oh, it's like first communion, but it's a wedding. Uh, and as far as I know, there, there's no global history study on them on the historical point of view, except some work on the wives of ministers and very high officials. So I met in the sources the wives of the men in three-piece suits. They were uh, indeed uh, quasi all married. Hmm? Yeah. I met only married women in this case. Uh, only one member of the high authority was not <coughs> married. Hmm. A trade unionist. Um, these wives were in general housewives. Even some of them had a strong educational background. Hmm? Uh, they studied, they worked before, uh, but they stopped uh, working when they got children, when their husband was appointed to high positions. Okay, well, it's something very common, but uh, they were at home taking care of the children in the traditional family model. Well, uh, in the 50s, uh, European institutions in Luxembourg were not exactly revolution revolutionary. And, uh, a social point of view. The couple is central to extra professional relationships. Uh, it is in the name of the couple that men speak out uh, in pri private matters. At the high authority, there were most of the time large families, four children uh, for many of them. In the case of the Albert Copé family, eight children. Uh, when the wife is involved in outside, uh, outside activities, um, it's uh, um, uh, also in a certain framework, uh, charitable work, social, religious activities of the community in which the family is involved. So wives, we know that they have this central role in the private sphere, at home and with the children. It's not that easy to discover you know, for, for this, uh, uh, this milieu. They are often praised for this very role and thanked in speeches all the time, or book signings, for their faithful devotion, unfailing service. By their action, we could ask if they participated in the birth of a new European identity. They participated, in my point of view, in this aspect of the European integration history, not the construction of the coal and steel market, of course, but the creation of a kind of European identity around the institution. <clears throat> and I must say, oral history is very important in this point of view. Um, they described and participated in this aspect. Um, 
family relations were important at the beginning of the European integration process. Few high officials, few civil servants from different countries with no friends there, uh, no relatives in Luxembourg, in a small town like Luxembourg. Uh, very quickly, the children go to the same new European school. The children Kopi and Elvik, for instance, were good friends in the same classes. I have some quotations here about, from the, the family Elvik Kopi, the daughters, uh, notably. And appear uh, in the discourse uh, um, about this aspect. Um, appeared the European, European identity. Um, they adopt, uh, in few years, a strong uh, European identity in some families, especially when a member of the family, well, the male, uh, the, the father, occupied a long-term position in the European institutions. For, so, for those who stayed few years only and go back very quickly on the national level, the discourse on common identity is not the same, at least a degree. Um, they talk also about the family spirit. Well, I think uh, this is certainly some, uh, sometimes idolized, uh, this uh, family spirit. It has uh, its own limits. Um, First, those of the social norm of the time. Uh, most of the members of the high authority were Christians, Catholic or Protestant. Some of them were very religious, Italians, notably Dino Delbo or Albert Coppe, the Belgian. Mass was a time for Catholic couples and families to meet. But the rules were strict. The social norm was strict in the 50s. Uh, indeed, uh, Sylvia Monet, uh, Jean Monet's wife, was a divorced Catholic, Catholic woman and she could not go to the Mass uh, despite her faith. So, exclusion uh, uh, was always not far. More generally, interpersonal relation, relationships between wives or from couple to couple uh, are important in the, in the constitution of political networks. Uh, forms a dense network ranging from real friendship uh, to simple frequentation of the same circles. Um, at least, women participated also in the construction of the of a European identity by testifying, by becoming witnesses uh, years or decades later. They are sources of the European integration history. Um, I met several women, I told you, during my research. I talked about that at the beginning of my presentation. Most of them were widows. They were the former wives, but they were widows or daughters. And uh, I was interested in um, but what I found there. They were very active in mentioning the memory uh, of their beloved husbands and fathers, far more than the sons I met, for instance. They were kind of guardians of the memory. They gathered documents, made archives available for journalists and researchers. They wanted to talk, well, to be heard about uh, this past. It was very interesting for the researcher, even if if it's challenging, but it's always the case in oral history, uh, but uh, with the uh, biographical approach, it's uh, worse. Um, of course, they have a certain vision uh, of their father, of their beloved uh, husband. Um, they could have been sometimes disappointed, I must say, with the direction uh, taken by the research. <laughs> Biography is not hagiography. They wanted to, to pay tribute, to rendre hommage, you know, when the historian must write the facts in their context, when he can. Apart their own worlds, wives and widows uh, I met opened rare windows for biographers of politicians on private life, on privacy, to, uh, thanks to private archives, which are precious to us. Um, Sometimes it's difficult. We don't know what to do with this material. It's not easy to manipulate. 
like, and this is an extract here, the, the love poems from uh, Enzo Giacchero that his widow kindly showed me, and she was so proud of uh, this, uh, this love poem. And, and she still loved him so much in, uh, after his death. Um, apart from the family, the private life, socialization, birth of European identity in these grown uh, European elites, and it's, it's certain that women are not in power, so we all agree about that. Where are the other women? Not no, wives or daughters, but uh, where are the other women at work, if they are torn, in the early days of European integration? Um, this is an extract of uh, Aude Fouquet's memoir on the woman in the administration of the high authority of the European Coal Institute. <laughs> and we have a few uh, women, but she talked about that uh, certainly yesterday. Um, there are uh, works uh, on... Uh, oh. The, the first works on women on European integration, or even women in international <coughs> relations, focus on the most visible women, uh, the rare women of power, who appear more than 20 years after the launch of the European communities. Um, it was not until the end of the 70s that the first women appeared at the highest level of the community. You know, Simone Veil, president of the European Parliament, 79, Simone Moses. Uh, mem member of the European Court of Justice, 81, Christian Scrivener and Vassou Papandreou in the European Commission, uh, 89. So the survey on women in the early days of the European integration, 50s and 60s, still to be carried out. And I think this conference show uh, that it has become a very active field, and uh, this is very interesting. So within the institutions, in the 50s and the 60s, where are the women? They are present as direct actors of the emerging community administration in subordinate, subordinate positions, uh, so-called feminine positions, interpreters, secretary, typist, operators, maintenance staff. And, well, um, we know that they exist, but how to find them? And uh, I did some... Um, Quick research in the research tools available um, because it's not an easy task to work on invisible women and subaltern jobs. Uh, we will face difficulties even in the sources in the archives. Just a quick research in the online portal of the Audiovisual Service of the European Commission, which is uh, uh, very um, impressive. Uh, so many photographs available photography is available, um, numerous resources. But it shows also many traps in the referencing, the indexation of the pictures. Uh, well, one photographic report on the high authority of the European Coal and Steel community at work, this is the name of the report, 50, 53. It, sh it shows pictures with women on the pictures, but without indicating neither names or functions, and sometimes they are only on the pictures, like uh, a part of the landscape, um, even if we suppose they are secretaries or interpreters. Huh? It is like this beautiful picture of Enzo Giacchero, which is his secretary. It's not me written uh, his secretary. This is the, the caption of the, uh, the picture from the 53. She's head down. She cannot, we cannot see her face. She has a typical position of submission, deference. Um, another one, the second one, uh, with Jean Monnet standing second from the left, and Jacques René Rabier, and a woman on the back, clearly at work, but she's not mentioned at all in the caption. No name, not even a function. I wanted to verify. I, of course, we understand the context of the 50s and this invisible work of women. So this is not a surprise for us. We know it's a trap for future researchers. But I wanted to verify, and uh, things were different from more recent times, with well-known figures, like uh, I took Vas uh, Vasso Papandreou. And I was surprised, because I, 
it was not that obvious when I, I, wrote, I wrote vasopapandreou in the research journal uh, to find pictures of her. And I have noticed that the metadata registered her as Georges Papandreou. So if I want to find uh, Vasso Papandreou, I need to write Georges Papandreou. Well, this is just a mistake, of course. But is it a, a mistake from someone behind the machine, or is it the, uh, the application, uh, which is uh, a structural uh, problematic, you know, which has structural problems? Uh, we don't know, but and we were talking about that at the coffee break. Is it um, mistakes are normal in these kinds of tools, but and in life in general? But are there more mistakes uh, when it's about women or when it's about men? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe a future research will answer that. Well, is it maybe? When an assistant uh, organizes a conference with two uh, professors, a male and a female, maybe you will verify two times the exact titles, you know, the exact titles of the, the male figure, maybe just one for the women figure. We were talking about that, and maybe more mistakes are, are made. So working on women means to do more efforts from under research to be a top detective, to avoid the traps of invisibilization, and to give the women back their place in the history. So, um, such research, uh, ongoing research on women history in the European integration history, uh, will contribute to complete the historiography, because I was talking about the tools, but situation for the classical historiography of the European integration history is almost the same as the sources. I include my own work sometimes. Um, women are globally absent, more than absent. They are made sometimes <coughs> invisible, even for historians. A strong renewal of the history, historiography is necessary. A uh, few examples of classical uh, uh, um, books and research on the 50s and 60s. Um, the reference book on the high authority written by Dirk Spierenburg and Raymond Poitvin in 1993 uh, on the caption of several images showing clearly one or two women. Well, the, the, the caption denies them, makes them invisible and change their gender. They are in French, un interprète. We can see on this picture a meeting of the high authority, uh, nothing special. There are two interpreters, two female interpreters, and in the caption, I uh, surround it in black, this is just un interprète, no name and no gender, okay? A tool. Um, does it became masculine without a name and surname, like ghosts in the, in the pictures? But it's the same, you know, all books like this German uh, uh, one on uh, Menschen institu uh, und Institution, and so uh, a book on the people of the, high, the, the, the European Coal and Steel community. Only two women were quoted in the index, um, and it's the same in many books of that uh, uh, of the historiography. But of course, uh, uh, in the high authority and in the European Coal and Steel community and in the institutions in general, women do not occupy the top positions. And we cannot, it's, it's not the question. But it's not a reason to deny the women who exist, to cancel them from the history. Um, so if we search deeper, uh, in, uh, at the high authority, uh, uh, the European Commission, the division of labor, as in the post-war society, no surprise there, neither. Uh, the division of labor seems quite clear. An executive uh, led by men, I told you, members of the executive, heads of cabinet, directors general, etc., with women working in office jobs, secretaries, typists, interpreters. Um, Future research will di discover who they were, how many they were, how they were organized or not, how they fight, how they interact, uh, what was their daily life in this men's world. 
and interpreters and secretaries seem to have an important role, certainly, certainly underestimated, at all stages of the community administration. But I'd like to know more about them. Uh, we read about um, Ursula von Meckers, Ursula von Meckers, one of the, the, one of the names that emerged from that time. The French German interpreter was, uh, I quote, uh, littéralement morte d'épuisement à force de chuchoter entre Jean Monnet et le vice-président allemand, Monsieur Hetzel. Well, here the woman is the link between the two most important personalities of the high authority. She's indispensable for good communication. So she is, according to Monet, attached to Hetzel's steps, even though they may use English for discussion. But an attachment that goes beyond strictly professional relations at times. And uh, we are uh, uh, in um, uh, a, a dark area, I think. Um, Frances is close, very close to uh, his interpreter. Um, and we have this uh, sentence uh, from Max Konstein, the, the secretary of the high authority, about, he was talking about Canadian to, uh, who was too close to the interpreter, a bit uh, seductor. Uh, he couldn't keep his hands of any girl around him. That created a lot of difficulties, especially when he moved on to Ursula von Meckers, uh, who was Edsel's baby. Not that Edsel had an affair with her, but Edsel re resented it very much. So she was in, uh, in Max Konstam uh, Heights. Um, she was seen as Edsel's baby. What does that mean? A uh, young woman among, among men of a certain age, could be uh, interesting to work on the voc vocabulary too. Uh, I did a few years ago quick research in the interviews available at the uh, uh, historical archives of the European Union, uh, and uh, we found faithful wives in general, faithful wives with respect and uh, children, etc., with perfect daughters. Then we found baby like that with Ursula von Mackers. Uh, another interview from Jacques René Rabier, former, uh, you know him. Uh, the only woman he talked about was une vieille bonne, an old <laughs> maid. Um, well, there is an analysis to do here. Um, so, this question of Edson's baby, more generally, what about male female relationships in Luxembourg and Brussels in the, this unbalanced situation? Men of power and subaltern women. Is it even possible to write this history? What are the sources? Will the witnesses from the time tell things differently now? Uh, now they are old, now time is gone, and time after feminist changes. What about patriarchy, paternalism, harassment, domination? How can this be written uh, without being an, uh, uh, anachronistic? Neither, huh? Touchy subject. So, and uh, well, I will end my presentation at the fifth point, but very quickly because it's not my specialty. Um, and the world after the 70s for me is uh, it's too, too close to me. It's not history. To conclude, the, so this is a very general paper anyway. I'd like to conclude on some perspectives of historical research, but I think we discuss about that all the, um, during all the seminar since yesterday. Well, first of all, of course, the gradual changes in the representation of women at the highest politi political position, the success of uh, feminist fights in, the, uh, in this era uh, is very important. Uh, it is, of course, this will renew uh, the, uh, the historiography. New research will reveal forgotten female personalities, like we heard today, uh, who will be added to the general historiography. So I hope one day general books on European integration history will be more balanced, gender balanced in all senses. Uh, the 80s and the 90s, despite I regret, but they are entering history totally for us, 30, 40 years after, after the, the archives are beginning to be opened and will st uh, stimulate new research in history, we know that. Develop development of gender studies, of course, is influencing the way historians work. 
the sociologist too, and will answer this question. Uh, regarding <coughs> Um, from Simon Pei, Vasu Papandreou, to Sola von der Leyen, are these women only exceptions or do they reflect a gradual feminization of the political power in Europe? We have already some uh, answers. And uh, to, to go back to my first question as a young PhD student, will it be normal one day for the next generation of young historians to do research on female figures at the highest level in politics? Uh, would it be normal? It's not like me in, in 20 years ago. Uh, I hope this will give birth to new occasions also in the European, uh, in the history of European integration after the, you know, this, uh, in the tw uh, 2010s, uh, there were uh, not that many new researches in European integration history. So yesterday, Dieter told me that. Uh, um, new and very diverse uh, perspectives were starting to uh, to emerge, and new PhD on very diverse subjects. So I think this is a, a new period. We are entering, we are entering a new period uh, in the historiography of European integration. Um, there is a work to do here, analyzing and comparing national and European <coughs> level, of course, differences, similarities, two different pathways or not. These are a proper European way for women in politics. And uh, a more personal point of view, these uh, renewed questions, research questions, uh, uh, will change certainly, certainly the way we teach uh, European integration history, because we are quasi all uh, researchers, but also professors, and we teach European integration history. Um, so I think it, it needs to be changed uh, also. And it's time to do it, but also for the, you know, it was very interesting this morning in the, this project of the Luxembourg University in uh, collecting oral memories, because I think it's time and it's urgent to do it. Uh, the oldest witnesses, even if women live longer than men, uh, are very few, and especially 50s and 60s, and it's urgent to collect their memory for, for this period. Uh, testimony on their own history, uh, to let them express about what is not visible in the archives and other sources. Oral history in women history is very important, uh, like for history of minorities in one way, uh, and it's essential. This kind of work uh, you, you presented this morning is very important. So, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul uh, Carbonet, for sharing with us uh, your quest to mm. make uh, invisible women yeah. in the 50s and 60s uh, visible. Um, also very interesting, the aspect on male-female relationships. Uh, what hits me always, uh, we are, soon we are, will be the 9th of May, mm. and Robert Schumann was born in Luxembourg, but he spent his last years in Tichazelle, and they always speak about a woman who was living in Tichazelle, mm -hmm. uh, doing the, the homework for Robert Schumann, but who, no, no, at least not the greater public knows mm -hmm. her name or where she comes from. So um, I would like to ask you here in the room and uh, also online <coughs> if you have questions, remarks, comments. Yeah. Yes, please. Miss Seidner. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, obviously, with the, the first slide on your reminiscing on your PhD, I, I could see myself in that as well, because I did the layer under yours, sort of the high um, officials. And I even interviewed a woman, um, Annette Bocher, um, mm -hmm. and she kind of didn't fit into my... <laughs> pattern because I was, as you, expecting to work only on men. So I, I probably didn't do her justice and this question of where the women, I did not pose it either. So my question would be more for the younger mm -hmm. uh, members of um, this conference. Is it more, are you looking automatically for the women? Um, I, do you have a different mindset now? Um, I mean, you don't have to, we can also discuss that <laughs> later, but I, I'd be really interested because I'm, I'm sort of more your generation. And then secondly, I, 
I agree with all the sociability where women are really important. And, and there was a lot about I mean, the families also meeting with the, with the Germans being included and, and um, getting um, there for the integration through the families. So Kornstamm, Bia, Godel are always you know, very much friends. And then also von der Leyen, she was actually the daughter of, of um, uh, now I interviewed him, <laughs> her father, Albrecht. Yeah, Albrecht. Albrecht, yeah, yeah, Ernst Albrecht, uh, and, and she grew up in Brussels in that, in that climate, and, <coughs> sorry, I'm, I'm just rambling, I, <laughs> I do have a, I, my question was more for, for, for the young ones, but I noticed in a recent book, on, and you asked the question at the end, is there a change, and I don't think there is so much, I mean, I'm guilty of that with this um, mm -hmm. handbook of European integration, where there's no chapter on women, in there. And then um, there's a book I'm reviewing on, on social Europe in the 70s, and the only woman in the index is um, uh, Astrid Lulling, and no one else, um, which I thought, so Europe from the left, I guess. And I thought, well, now being sensitive, so sensitive to the mm. issue. So I'm not sure it's changing, actually. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly the questions I have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no change for the moment, but. Uh, we need first to realize ourselves that uh, things need to change. I think perhaps we can uh, alternate with uh, one question online. There was Christine Dupont who was raising her hand. Christine, do you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, I try to start my video so you can see me as well. So yeah, thank you thanks. very much. Be nice. Okay, <laughs> yeah, hello. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I knew your work already because I read this, uh, this book about women in European integration by um, uh, Francois Thibault and Eden Vibin. And uh, I, I'm really fascinated by those uh, subaltern women you are, you are presenting and the fact that they have no names in captions and... Uh, and I think we, as I'm a museum curator, so I'm a curator at the House of European History in Brussels, mm -hmm. and I'm very concerned about uh, the visibility of women in, in history, as a historian myself. Uh, and I think we have, as, a, um, as museum professionals and archivists, also something, of course, for uh, our colleague from the European Archive in, in Florence, uh, we have to do this work of renaming uh, women in the captions, in collections, in, uh, in uh, archive descriptions, uh, etc. And um, yeah, it, of course, as you said very rightly, it's very difficult because it, 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 I, I really appreciated the way you said um, doing, uh, searching about the, these women, it, it, it requires extra effort, you know. <laughs> And it's, it's really true, and we all, if we all have done, for me, it's just a little bit, because I'm not a specialist like you, but a, lot, a little bit of research about, uh, about uh, women history, it's extremely uh, time consuming, but uh, of course it's worth, and I think we have to do that as also as uh, heritage professionals, I would say, as it is done in, in lots of museums about naming models that are uh, in, in 19th century paintings, for instance, or, or things like that. So that's more a comment. And my second comment is for a little bit for all of you, because unfortunately I will have to, to leave you, but I'm following your works uh, since uh, yesterday, uh, second half of the afternoon, and it's really fascinating. I wanted to tell you that there is an enormous interest about uh, those uh, topics and especially about the, the role of women in European integration. Uh, as you know, as you might know, the House of European History is part of the European Parliament. And in the European Parliament, there are... Um, there is a lady that might be maybe in the room. I don't know. She told me that she will uh, she will follow the, the conference. Uh, who organize uh, trainings for civil servants or for all staff of the parliament about uh, 16 women that have made Europe, and actually lots of them she had chosen as examples or were present in your talks yesterday and uh, and today, um, and. 
as far as I can judge, that this training is offered to uh, to uh, Parliament staff several uh, several times a month. It it really uh, meets an enormous success. So I think there is really uh, something there, and also that uh, our colleagues from the Jean Monnet House in Bazoche, because we the Jean Monnet House in Bazoche is a kind of uh, now. Uh, uh, depending on the house of uh, from the house of European history as well, they are also doing lots of things to make uh, Sylvia Monet that you mentioned as well more visible in uh, in in this place. So I think there are lots. There, there is a huge interest uh, in for us also in visitor surveys asking for more women, uh, uh, for more visibility, etc. So I just wanted to thank you and to to tell you that uh, we we are also interested and we. we would like to uh, to make your research more more visible uh, where if if we can and uh, and where we can and I would be happy to to discuss with uh, with you about how to how to make those researchers more visible at the level of popularization vulgarization and uh, museum work and uh, and in our museum uh, as well so more comments but really thank you for this interesting conference. Yeah, thank you. And um, yes, we have we all have to do efforts at all level <laughs> about uh, this subject. And uh, um, for instance, I uh, I showed um, the yes, please if you can show it again, um, uh, a table from Old Fukuoka work on uh, secretaries, female secretaries. And I was curious because I didn't know the, uh, them at all. And uh, yes, uh, yeah. No. I do it. Yep. Yeah, uh, this one. And Suzanne Miguel, Suzanne Dijen, Emily Bald, Hélène Isna, Liz Lodres, six women, just like that in a table. So, um, quick, quick research in the European Union uh, Historical Archive on the catalog. Nothing. No one appeared. So, strange, right? So, uh, there are uh, no names to create a um, it's, an, it's an example of index problems and a work on indexation, referencement, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Christine Dupont, for your insights from Brussels. Uh, we go back here in the room. So oh, I think I, in, in view of the time and the three more conference coming, I, I keep my questions or discussion for the, for the break. Thanks. Okay. See. Good. Yeah, we are on time. So we are on time again. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mof oh, uh, We will pass on to the next uh, panel and invite uh, the presenters to come to come here. There is no no break. Elena. <laughs> Katarzyna Hanik. They're online. And there is Marina Bantio. We should speak a second.
So we are jumping in the last session of the conference uh, with a panel gathering three uh, papers. Uh, the first one um, is presented by Katarzyna Hanik, uh, University of Silesia in Katowice. Um, I forgot to mention her yesterday, and I do apologize for that. So, uh, Katarina is a PhD student at the doctoral school at the University of Silesia. Uh, she has a master uh, in um, 2021 with a master thesis entitled The Phenomenon of, of Scandal in the 21st Century, written under the supervision of Professor Agnieszka Dniecka Tsapska. Um, and um, her main um, research uh, subject is the manifestation of tabooization in the autobiography of the last decades. Uh, Anieszka, uh, sorry, uh, Katarzyna has today the paper entitled The Price of True Story, the history of European integration in the autobiographical prose of Anieszka Osiecka. Katarina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, I'm coming from a completely different uh, research. I'm actually from literary studies, and my main interest was the tabooization in autobiography. And when I was researching Anieszka Osiecka, who is one of my main interests, I came across uh, this very significant tabooization about her political involvement. And I have realized that in many autobiographical um, representations, there is this, this stress, this fear about political engagement, lack of it, the form of it. And in Osiecka's case, it is very, um, very, very interesting, interesting um, perspective. Agnieszka Osiecka is an immensely insignificant significant figure in Polish culture. She was the author of approximately 2,000 song lyrics, most of which still have iconic status today. Osiecka's influence on Polish post-war culture was so prominent that many of the phrases and expressions found in the lyrics of her songs exist today in the Polish discourse as common phrases and sayings. Modern users of the Polish language are often unaware that it was the poetess from Saska Kempa who established these well-known sayings. The status of Osiecka is therefore remarkably intriguing. Never fully recognized as a master artist, she is the author of most of the iconic lyrics written in Poland during the period of the Polish People's Republic existence. As Jerzy Urban wrote, and I quote, due to the fact that her poetry is being sung, sung, it shapes the imagination, tastes, sensibilities, and moods of millions. Because it is being sung, however, opinion shapers responsible for ranking poets classify her as a mediocre poetess. It is not Miłosz, it's Osiecka who moves us. It is her who sets the tone for millions. It is her who creates the tone of conversations. It is her vocabulary that imposes itself on generations. It is her verses that intrusively implant themselves in memory. It is she who writes down those moods that generations of youth radiate. It is her who, in the moment of uncertainty, comforts us, saying, life is a ball. The recognition of the lyricist and her place in the pantheon of people to, of merit to Polish culture seems virtually indisputable. Nevertheless, the times and circumstances in which she grew up creatively and pursued a be bewildering career provided to be much more challenging since, quote-unquote, success in the People's Republic is a very, quote-unquote, ungrateful phenomenon, and any creative activity during this period proved to be a real challenge. How incredibly intriguing this issue can be is evidenced, for example, by the functioning of the Center for Philological Research on PRL censorship in Poland, which has devoted an entire series of publications to the analysis of this period. Polish culture of the communist period and the situation of the artist in it, uh, in in it is a phenomenon worthy of a separate dissertation. These few decades were made marked by many political twists which entailed drastic changes in the cultural space to be finally happily ended by the collapse of communism in Poland and something the poet did not not live to see by joining the European Union. Agnieszka Osiecka was fortunate to write and create for almost all this time. 
The poet, born in 1936, made her debut as early as the 1950s at the Students' Satirist Theatre, which was an organization of young people with a strong political commitment. In her later years, Oshetska methodologically distanced herself from politics, eventually regretting this decision years later, as evidenced by her autobiographical statement from the 90s. Nonetheless, I believe that Oshetska's numerous comments on the political and cultural situation, despite not presenting any categorical and defined views, constitute a remarkably inter intriguing portrayal of the situation of a person dedicated to the culture at the time when every gesture of an artist tied them in one way or another to the current political climate. In order to be able to reconstruct the complete picture sketched by Oshetska, I decided to divide her statements into three periods. The youthful period, which includes Oshetska's education and the political shaping by her peers, the period of accounting for her lack of political involvement during the period of activity of the Solidarity Union, and the post-transformation statements, which are comments of a social nature summarizing the state of a new Poland a new Poland that could be defined by, by its fascination with the so-called West, and a new Poland that was finally allowed to model itself after it. The Jankosiecka was a person shaped by extremists. extremities. Her father, who for years tried to make her a wunderkind, instilled in her the importance of being an above-average, frugality-avoiding woman, living in the, the life to the fullest. Thus, Oshetska's childhood was marked by learning languages, jumping grade, and wild strawberries in the post-war winter. Years later, the writer recalled that Viktor Oshetsky, her father, tried to have a great influence on her education, so he fought against the church, communism, and the nationalism, the manifestation of which he considered to be the commonly read in Polish classes novel Krzyżacy by Polish Nobel Prize winner Henryk Sienkiewicz. The influence of her father and how he shaped the young Oshetska, along with the fear instilled in her by her mother, for years to come will continue to be a sort of quote-unquote excuse for the poet who will begin to picture herself as someone vulnerable to influence and incapable of making her own independent, calculated judgments. Thus, she will also attribute her turn to political involvement in the 50s to subsequent mentors. And I quote, in the late 1950s, and all of the 1960s, my friends taught me something important in which I wasn't taught at home, which I wasn't taught at home, a social attitude. Andrzej Jarecki, a poet and my boyfriend of the time, called our songs poetry of citizens. Andrzej had something in common with Jeromsky's characters, but for him, I wouldn't have written The Eggheads, a song which was the youth political anthem for years. However, before Oshitska became associated with the student satirical theater, she wrote an exceptionally critical review of one of their performances. I quote, how did it happen that I wrote a review of the third STS program, which was later so rebuked by Andre? In the autumn of 1954, I came to see a performance of The Simple Man. At the time, it struck me as insanely harsh and principled, and I was horrified by it. Today, I laugh about it, but at the time between 1952 and 1954, when I was studying at the Faculty of Journalism, I had some struggles in the Polish Youth Union. I was expelled from the organization, then I was accepted back, and the expelling was changed to a, to a reprimand. I was deeply intimidated by it. So when the so-called Thau came, I was blindly enthusiastic about it. I was in love with the Thau, and the students at Rika Theatre people seemed to me to be a grim fighters of a cause foreign to me. Maybe that's why I wrote a critical review after seeing the confrontation. Again, Oshitska's behavior seems to stem from the fact that she associated herself with an organization whose ideology she did not, did not seem to fully understand, the Polish Youth Union. As Marek Wierzbicki wrote, it was the first mass youth organization in the history of Poland that aimed to extend its influence to all young people in Poland and which, at the same time, had, by order of the communist authorities, a monopoly on conducting ideological and educational activities among them. Because of the totalitarian aspirations of the communist system, which were undoubtedly pre present during this period, the Polish Youth Union, later called ZMP, tried to take total control over all areas of your life of youth life. Thus, it was a special role that made the core the main element of the Stalinist model of the youth movement. For the poet, the Polish Youth Union was the space of her first and the only such clear, clear political declaration. There, 
at school, I fell in love with the utopian socialism Oshetska writes. Even later, when I attended the Faculty of Journalism, I was asked by the ZMP, who are you? I answered, I am a utopian socialist. It is certainly puzzling how a young girl who claims to have been shaped by Viktor Osiecki succumbed to such an unconditional fascination with utopian socialism. Osiecka chooses a new authority and blindly follows its lead. She once again portrays herself as a person who is willing to believe that there is someone who understands her better than she understands herself and who is able to provide a better evaluation of her actions. In doing so, she seems to overlook the fact that her quote-unquote, struggles in the Polish Youth Union may be a reminiscence of the impression she made on her colleagues as a daughter shaped by Osiecki. And I quote, at the gathering where I was expelled from the, Z from the ZNP, there were more than a hundred people. People stood up and spoke, some of them making no sense at all, uh, confusing me with other colleagues. They added a lot that I was a BBC radio agent, that's not true, that I had a white phone at home, true, from Goodwill, that I went to church, then not true. That I laughed at the mass meeting after Stalin's death, not true. At a long late night expelling gathering, I suddenly began to break down. I have every word of this uh, emerging breakdown in my diary, but I'm pained to read it. I see that I'm running out of time. Uh, so I will have to uh, sum up. Uh, after Oshitska, uh joined the Student Satrika Theatre, then she began, to, she began to be involved with the Parisian culture. The organization that was founded in France and was led by Jerzy Gedward, uh, with whom she became uh, with whom she became friends, and she was uh, trying to smuggle through the border uh, a couple of books in order to be um, to be printed in the second uh, um, um, in in the Parisian culture. Uh, this caused her to be. Um, to have obviously many, many problems with uh, the police at the time. And she had her passport taken for seven years. Uh, therefore, she decided to write a critical review of the activism of Gedroit and Par uh, Parisian uh, culture. Uh, and this way she made herself uh, kind of an enemy to uh, all the people who, who thought she, she, she's a friend to them. She wrote that Gidrich is kind of losing it. He doesn't understand that the new Poland has to be different. And since that time, Oshetska seems to be guided by fear. And this fear changed her for, the, for her entire life. And that's why she never actually got involved in the political activism, especially in the year 1976 when everybody expected her to uh, stop writing, to stop publishing. She was even called a bitch to publishers in a bitch. Uh, another very uh, important comment about her uh, lack of activism was the comment of Adam Michnik, who said that she never understood the Polish democratic opposition of the 1970s. And she agreed, she said that she obviously does not understand this political opposition, and she doesn't know how to be a writer, be a poet in that time. Later, when the martial law was uh, introduced in Poland, she was in a terrible position. She wrote a letter to the minister asking him to let her leave the country because the seven year period when she has her passport taken uh, has already passed. And she said, I cannot dance to that. I cannot write a song right now. I cannot be a person who cheers people when something like this is happening. Uh, she even uh, tried to take place of one of the most important uh, prisoners at the time and that was her only act of act the only activism he took part in at the same time what has to be has to be remembered she wrote a couple of texts that were a very important anthems of the generation she wrote the echoes that i mentioned before but she managed to write her prose that was called white blouse that was supposed to be understood as the Mm, kind of prosaic anthem of young women of the time who uh, tried to 
uh, who tried to see themselves as <coughs> solidarity activists. And to, to sum up uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to present in here is that in Poland there is this strong prerogative to show the activism that led towards uh, inclusion of uh, the, East, the Western thought as this kind of heroic myth, as this kind of heroic activism. But Osiecka never did that. She didn't have a chance to uh, present herself as a heroine, as someone who, who fights, as someone who has this um, concrete political declaration. She was writing her songs. She was writing about the moods of gener the generations. And to sum up, I will allow myself once again quote her, who said, I am not fit to chant neither for the march of enthusiasts nor for the pessimists. Instead of writing, for example, that the streetcar of history has arrived at the depot, I would rather speak about the crumpled streetcar tickets <coughs> that passengers threw away. It is difficult to guess how Oshitska would, would perceive Poland of the year 2023, perhaps during the ongoing dispute over the influence of the European Union on Poland, we would be able to see once again that it takes a poetess with Oshitska's sensi sensitivity to remember about the crumpled Lviv Przemysl tickets still traveling through the wind at the Polish border. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I open the floor for questions, uh, in-person questions and online. Yes, Katya. Um, so in your title, you mentioned European integration. I wonder how was she around for the transition um, to, you know, from communism to, to democracy? And then um, so did she write about this or um, yes. and in what terms? Uh, because uh, lack of time, I had to omit this part, but obviously Yes, she um, stayed true to herself in a way that when 1989 happened in Poland and the Iron Curtain crumbled and we were finally free to, to, to express ourselves fully and to model our politics after the political uh, climate we so much uh, admired, uh, she managed to see this change in Poland, but what is really interesting she was kind of critical about the new middle class that appeared, a new middle, new money uh, class that appeared. And she was very, very um, against all types of um, faking a different approach, a different social climate, a different... She wanted Poland and Polish people to stay, stay true to their heritage to the heritage of pain, to the heritage of fear, which she very much, very much emphasized in her every, in her every speech, in, in, in her, excuse me, every writing, in her every, uh, every, um, in her every act of writing, because she wasn't only a poetess, she was also writing prose. Uh, yes, yes, Karen. Thank you very much for making me discover these very interesting Polish artists. I have to say that I've never heard of her, uh, which obviously is my <laughs> failure. Uh, I think I have two different kinds of questions. It was interesting that you mentioned that she tried or was involved to a certain extent in the literary artistic scenery in, in, in Paris and that she was trying to take over uh, the Iron Curtain, some books. Was there any intention from her to act as a mediator between East, uh, East and West? And then I forgot my second question, so I will stick with that one. <laughs> okay. uh, so the activism of the Parisian Cultura uh, actually allowed Polish writers who couldn't write in the first circulation of books that was officially accepted by the censorship, uh, to publish their books that were much more critical of the system that existed. And I think that Osiecka, uh, she, at the beginning, I was, I was describing her as, a, her as a person who kind of steps into the situation and lets people, her mentors, guide her. And that was the case with Kultura. She called the meeting with Parisian Kultura 
uh, people, the, 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 the surrounding of, of Persian culture as a brain surgery. It was, it was the moment where she discovered that uh, maybe uh, Poland, as she sees them, as STS drove it, as Desert Empire drove it, isn't uh, exactly the Poland she would like to see in the future. But she was, after she came back from Persian Kultura, she had her passport taken away for seven years just because she was there and just because they couldn't actually prove to her that she smuggled those uh, those books but they could see she was continuing to co have correspondence with Jerzy with her um, family and they took her passport and I think that her entire history, her entire life biography would go differently if she wasn't this much scared I think the fear was the refrain of her life, and up from that point, she, there was no turning back. She could only be scared, she could only run away, she could only mm, mm, reach towards the uh, gestures that are so crazy, like trying to take a prisoner's place, but she couldn't actually show any type of political activism as we understand it in Poland so by being heroic, by um, kind of standing up for herself, by writing a manifestos. No, she was writing her prose, her, um, her poetry, but she couldn't make this movement and be a mediator because she was so scared. So her entire testimony stays in what she writes in her prose, in her, in her poetry, and later what she was finally brave to, to show in her autobiographical prose. And I now recall my second, which was more of a comment than a question, actually. I think one of the, because what you, what you, you mentioned political activism, and one of the things that struck me is that a lot of the women we've discussed, they were actually civil servants or involved in the institution, had some sort of institutional role, but we haven't really discussed female activists, uh, which also have been playing a role. Uh, perhaps we also mentioned that uh, to a greater extent in the next, uh, in the next uh, intervention, uh, because obviously lobbies have these institutionalized activism, but I think this is also something that we need to consider that, you know, the females come in all shapes and forms and, and, and all kinds of different roles. Uh, and that also we need to look at the, I think Katia also is a little bit at the, the, board, the, the, front, the, the borderline between activism and, Ooh, and yeah, yeah the, 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 sometimes the, the borders are, are, are a little bit blurred. Uh, but I think this is also something we need to, that, you know, political activism also plays a role in our changing the course of European integration. So that's just uh, more. Uh, thank you, Karin. Uh, Karin. Uh, I'd like to ask you uh, a question, too. Uh, you mentioned that um, Agnieszka uh, Osiecka um, um, set a, a goal in, in her creation to... Uh, emerge a social attitude, and you mentioned uh, the need of solidarity. Uh, there were some entanglement with Solidarność uh, at the time, or she was influenced by it, by the movement, by the events of the time. Uh, actually, uh, she wrote this amazing letter after the imprisonment of many of her colleagues. Because to, to give you a little bit more of a context, when she writes her autobiographical prose, she writes it in a way um, that it is an interview with herself. Uh, so she asks him herself, she basically attacks herself. Weren't you ashamed of yourself when you were sitting on a plane, traveling, writing, and your friends were sitting in, in prisons? And actually, she answers that, yes, she was very, very... Uh, she was very ashamed of it, and she keeps being ashamed of it. And what is really remarkable about Osiecka is that when, she, when the martial law was introduced, uh, in the letter that I mentioned that she wrote, she wrote that the only time she wasn't afraid was the moment when she realized that the Solidarity Union was created. But she was never actually Mm, a part of this union per se, to, to, to say that she was one of the active members. No, she just 
found another mentor, another person, another inspiration. And it, um, um, that's why she started writing letters, which is another part of her, her autobiographical prose that were published years and years later. Out of this fear, she started writing letters to Michnik, one of the father founders of Solidarity, where she was expressing her fear, where she was expressing her fascination, where she was expressing her drive towards uh, this activism, while at the same time telling him that she doesn't have this clarity and he, she keeps being afraid of making the wrong decision. Because uh, on top of the fear of being indoctrinated, on top of being feared to be put in the jail by the police, she was then uh, again afraid of making the wrong decision, of um, performing the wrong act of activism. So she said, she, I will just uh, stick to my, to my <coughs> writing, I will just express myself through my writing, but she couldn't be an active member. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for these insights. There are questions online. Uh, if not, thank you, thank you very much uh, for, for your presentation, Katarzyna. Uh, we continue with uh, Marina uh, Bantiu, who is online. Uh, she is in Greece for the moment. Uh, she um, is PhD in modern and contemporary Greek history from Union University. Presently, she is the adjunct lecturer of history, didactics, and oral history at the University of Thessaly. Uh, she uh, is active in the uh, master program methodology of criticism and publication of historical sources at the Department of History of the Union, Union University. And today she will be with us from, uh, from Greece in presenting the paper in, entitled Aspects of the Participation of Greek Women in the European Women's Lobby uh, three, three Narratives. Sorry. So, um, welcome to the conference online, Marina, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me online to this conference and giving me the opportunity to talk about an oral history, a part of an oral history project conducted here in Greece. Uh, please confirm me that you can hear me and also you can see my presentation. Yes, it's yeah. perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, the issue of gender equality is one of the fundamental principles of the European Union, which cooperates with national institutions and organizations such as the European uh, Women's Lobby. The European Women's Lobby is an international uh, confederation of women's organizations and represents more than 2,000 women's organizations with delegations in all uh, European Union's member states. It was founded in 1990 and is the largest coalition of women's NGOs in the European Union promoting women's rights and <clears throat> equality. Founding members were national organizations from Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, Portugal, Spain, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom, as well as 17 major European women's organizations. This has its own um, delegation to the European Women's Lobby, which has been actively involved over the years voluntarily, representing 15 national um, organizations. The national organizations and members work voluntarily in all areas of economic, social, political, cultural, working life with the aim of uh, equal and democratic participation and treatment of uh, uh, women and men without exclusion and discrimination. The Greek delegation of the European Women's <coughs> Lobby, based on the statute and the action plan, focuses, among other things, on the integration of the principle of equal treatment of uh, both genders, informing and promoting issues related to the fight against violence, illegal trafficking of women, balanced participation of women and men in positions of uh, responsibility, and the protection of human and social rights. 
This ongoing research focuses on the European women's lobby through the case of three um, uh, Greek women based on their uh, biographical um, interviews from the archive of the Library of Equality and Gender Issues and the Richer Project collection of our testimonies of prominent women and informants on issues of gender equality and the history of women's struggles implemented by the National Center for Social Research in Greece. Additionally, archival evidence with references to the European Women's Lobby from Women of Europe Review, from the archives of the European Union and archives of the European Parliament, and reports, statutes of operation, letters, and proceedings of conferences of the um, European uh, of, of the, um, uh, Lobby of European Women are taken into account. The three interviews were given to researcher Maria Thanopoulou, and the purpose of this paper is to highlight the role and the participation of Greek women in the European women's lobby. Based on content analysis, the research explores three uh, semi-structured um, life narratives. The first oral testimony belongs to Effie Kaliga, who was president of the National Council of Greek Women. The interview was given on June 16, uh, 2013, in uh, which information is given about the interview's childhood during the years of the occupation, her studies at the Technical University, and her work as uh, an engineer. Her involvement in the women's movement can be traced back to the late 1960s, focusing on the participation in the National Council of Greek Women and the European Women's Lobby, as well as in the publication of the Women of Europe Review. The second interview belongs to Ketty uh, Costavara, the interview was given to on May 11, 2013. Ketty Papariga Costavara has participated in numerous actions of uh, women's issues at the national and European level. Among other things, she was the coordinator and special advisor and editor of the first report of the Hellenic National Observatory on combating violence against women, a uh, founding member of the European Network for the Fight Against uh, violence against women and a member of the European Research Committee on Sexual Harassment in Workplaces. <coughs> he was also an independent expert on violence against uh, women at the Council of Europe and a member of the Board of Directors at the European Women's Lobby between 1996 and 2002. Katie Costavara narrates the history of her family with left-wing origins, her studies in law and her professional path as a lawyer in criminal law matters and mainly in the defense of rape victims. She then narrates her involvement and activity in women's organization in Greece and Europe um, with mentions on um, issues on violence against women, trafficking and women's rights, concluding with evaluations on her personal path in the women's movement and the course of in Greece and in Europe. Finally, Joanna Manganara former ambassador and councillor of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and member of the Board of Directors of the Association of Women Rights between 1980 and 2008, uh, gave her interview on April 13, 2013. And in the interview, she refers to her family history and her studies in sociology. She describes her professional career and her participation in Associ Association for Women's Rights and the European Women's uh, lobby conveying her experiences. Through these um, cases, through, the, through these three women in the European Women's Lobby, and um, the evidence, as I mentioned before, aspect of the participation of action of Greek women in the European network with the aim of political presence and visibility in uh, Europe will be highlighted. The lobby was founded in September 90 when, according to Caliga, the idea was ripe for the founding meeting. One or two people from each country were authorized to pass information to their country and see how they could gather as much as the many organization as possible from the country to participate with some delegation in the lobby. He emphasizes here that in this field at the European and national level, he worked a lot and learned a lot because very experienced executives from the European area, uh, from uh, European organization, national delegation, and especially from large um, European organizations, have branches in various countries participated. 
Kaliga describes the establishment of the lobby as follows. I quote, the idea started in Brussels and it actually started from a woman, Fausta Desorms, who had the field of information on women's issues in the community and thus created the magazine Women of Europe. And because of the magazine, they understood what she was missing and what she might need to do so the voice of women can be better heard by the European Commission. And she experimentally started the effort to create what the word says, a woman's lobby from the countries of Europe. The word lobby is the truth. Uh, this is wh what we wanted to happen so that next to the Commission, there would be a spokesperson for the position of the women of Europe who would pass them to the European Commission and defend them as much as possible. It continues. Nobody's perfect and neither was a lobby when it started in 85. Both it was too much uh, work afterwards. From 1986 to 1987, the meetings began to see how these things would be and how we could work and bring organized women together in European countries because it was not easy for them Battered ones, but to pre uh, represent as large groups as possible and to represent minorities as well. We were there in five. The idea, the first was uh, came up, and in the first official invitations, Greece had invited the National Council of Greek Women as a place of the Association of Women's Rights. Various pioneers have previously campaigned for the establishment of the uh, women's lobby at the European level, and from 1982, conferences were held by the member states of the European Economic Community. In uh, 1987, 120 women representing 85 organizations called for the creation of a structure for interest open to all interested women's organizations to exert pressure on European and national institutions to ensure better defense and representation of women's interests. In a second resolution, the delegate called on the European Commission to lend its support for the organization in early 1988 of a meeting with a view to the implementation of such a structure. The founding was decided at a conference in London in 1987 and they implemented in the years that followed until 1990. When asked, Kaliga, um, who she considers milestones in her journey in the women's movement, Kaliga mentions, among other things, her participation in the establishment of an important European institution, as, it, uh, as she describes it. Kaliga considers that it was a valuable apprenticeship for her years dealing with the response for the um, magazine Women of Europe, which helped her because of your great response and the National Council in the cause of the creation of the European Women's Lobby. They describes it as a very nice idea, and nevertheless, your bitterness towards the development is evident, saying, the development may not yet live up to the efforts that went into establishing it, but I still believe that there is a room for improvement. She believes that they were wrong in that this group in order to play the, its role as a lobby had to have financial independence, but it was created with funding from the Commission. And while they had foreseen this and said that they should aim to become financially independent soon, because as I said, if you're financially dependent, you cannot make a counter argument. Unfortunately, they did not succeed in this. He also refers to her finding that in recent years, the statute of the European lobby has been changed under various pretexts, essentially trying to limit costs because of the Commission says that costs must be reduced and they end up replacing a board of directors with an executive committee, reducing the meetings of the board of directors, leading to reduction in uh, representatives. In this way, she emphasizes that women are moving away from this particular body instead of coming together. And she sadly notes uh, the following. If we really, we really have these millions of members, as they are calculated behind the organizations, and if we were asked each one of them a euro a year, we would have it richly funded. Recalling members from their years of presence in the European Women's Lobby, points out that the importance of getting to know and relating to people, exchanging meetings, things that are lost through the conferences. Nevertheless, he maintains that we should give some more time to the lobby, considering it very important that Greece has not left out of this experiment as he characterizes it. 
the recognized the social significance of women's activists group participating, lobbying, and collaborating to initiatives regarding to the uh, civil society in EU. Brittany Costavara contributed significantly to the women's struggles to highlight and fight against violence uh, against women as a target for public intervention in Greece and the European Union. She remained persistent in her belief that a robust legislative framework is required to protect victims, and uh, she actively en engaged in the 20 years promotion of domestic abuse legislation through the membership of the women's movement. She was a pioneer in alerting women's group about uh, European Union's proceedings and represented Greece in the European Women Lobby's Observatory on Violence Against Women since its establishment and for many years. I'm sorry. The interview, um, the, the interviewer focuses on uh, one point by asking her if she means uh, that when she gained power, the European lobby meant something else. Papariga uh, Costavara answers positively, wanting to tell in detail what happened. He argues that even through the lobby was doing well, women who may have not nothing to do with feminism as a state must belong to organizations, multi-person organizations who succeeded and got the votes to get in the, into the positions of power in the lobby. Further, she argues that uh, women used the lobby for personal promotion and as a result did not promote feminist uh, principles. Savara was in a position of power in the lobby for six years, as long as uh, the statute of the lobby states, stating that after six years, you must stay out of power for two years, and you can be in the delegation, but not in a position of power, and after two years to come back. Um, Savara is the only one who mentions um, an internal dispute, mainly at the national level uh, of the delegation and not in the European lobby. She maintained a negative attitude towards her suggestion, um, stating that she uh, she has nothing to do with feminism and she has nothing to do with um, uh, with the European women's lobby. After a series of difficulties uh, with her suggestion regarding the assumption of the position, she said, "Quote: That's why I say the power ate us. That is where we were separated. That's why I can no longer talk about milestones other than the ones I mentioned. It was reversed the feminist movement since the lobby accepts such representation, uh, meaning from people with uh, no knowledge on the subject." Marina, uh, I do apologize. Five minutes left Five. from our presentation. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, sitting to the final interview, Manganara, uh, member of the board of directors of the European Women's Lobby, represented the International Alliance of Women in it. Um, sorry, trying to um, save some time. She refers to the initiatives she was taking in the lobby. Uh, she had taken the initiative to promote an urgent resolution concerning the economic crisis and women. Uh, in addition, in 2011, she took the initiative to promote an argument resolution again uh, within the framework of the lobby's General Assembly on the Arab Spring and women which asked the members of the lobby, the European Commission and other European authorities to support these women to advance their rights and build together uh, sustainable democratic changes. And in 2012, in Budapest, um, within the framework of the Lobby General Assembly, she took the initiative to organize a seminar on the effects of the crisis on women in Southern Europe and Ireland, which was supported in France. Um, to sum up very quickly, uh, there is a difference between these women regarding their approach and perception of the European Women's Lobby. We noticed that Costa Vara does not have positive perception of how um, the um, EWL evolved. And we could say that happens mainly because of her personal disappointment on her successor. And um, on the other hand, we have um, Aliga and Manganara that they see the optimistic evolution of the European women's lobby in its future. However, all three women see their membership and their active participation as a major achievement. And in addition, it is observed that 
the interviewee generally believe in the effectiveness of the interventions promoted through the European Women's Lobby and in the positive effects of European gender policies. Um, the priority set by the Greek organizations when Greece assumed the presidency in the first half of 2003 were the important changes in Europe that were an opportunity for specific interventions and initiatives uh, supported by the Greek section. And, um, to sum up, acting, um, the EWL was acting as a forum for increased exchange, cooperation and integration. And we could see that in national delegation as, uh, as well. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm so sorry for the time, um, if, if I preceded the time. Thank you. We open, uh, open the floor for questions in person and online. Yes, Dita, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Marina, for this interesting presentation. Well, I'm, as archivist, I'm intrigued uh, to learn, have you uh, contacted the, the European Women's Lobby Association in Brussels? Did you see archival documents from their end? Uh, or not, because we haven't yet been in touch with them, but they are on our radar uh, for potential archival deposit. What, what is your uh, impression? Thank you. Um, uh, this is an ongoing research. I still haven't conducted um, uh, women from European Women's Lobby. Um, I have uh, found some archives that are on the historical archives of the European Union and uh, but they are held online and also archives of the European Parliament. And there are many internal documents from uh, proceedings of the conference and the statute of the operations, uh, which I was able to find and uh, add in, um, in this time of the, of the research. It was um, a, a difficult to find some um, photos or some videos, some visual sources of the time. I still haven't found anything. Hope in the future that works better. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I would like to ask myself a question. Uh, what is the current situation of the uh, lobby of women uh, in Greece? Uh, you have a lady th that is the president of the republic. So uh, how uh, women are uh, organized uh, themselves today in order to reinforce this, this lobby of women? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, till today, the um, Greek delegate of the European Women's Lobby is active and it has um, a new uh, a new board. Um, unfortunately, uh, the archive of the Greek delegation is um, is unordered, and um, there is um, and it's very scattered. So at the beginning, we are at the part of the um, interviews and uh, some documents from the Greek section that are articles from newspapers and mag magazines about the um, uh, Greek delegate. And uh, hopefully, um, we have more interviews about the um, Greek delegate's board from now that uh, are, are, we're trying to get in contact and have them. Uh, I have a complimentary question. Uh, you talk about archives. Dita mentioned the question of, of archives and sources. Uh, what are the mm. condition, the, the present condition to, to accede to archives in Greece? It is easy, it is complicated. How the GDPR regime is functioning? Could you share this, uh, this experience with us? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, the archives are, um, some of them are open and some of them are under permission. Um, also, some of them are digitalized, so 
um, it's easier for researchers to um, to find them. But the, the metadata uh, could say that uh, do not help to find specific um, uh, specific keywords. For example, you might need for your research. Um, but apart from, apart from this, uh, the archives for the Greek delegate, as I said before, it's scattered and it's very difficult to gather archives for the Greek delegates. That's why uh, there is no liter literature on the Greek delegate of the European Women's Lobby, and that's why we're, I'm trying to conduct a research on the Greek part of the European Women's Lobby. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Marina, for your presentation uh, and being with us virtually. Uh, now we uh, are uh, going to the last presentation of uh, our uh, conference. Uh, it is entitled Rethinking of European Women's Effort for Gender Equality. And the presentation will be made by uh, Dr. Melina Nour Churchill Chinli. Uh, it's right True, yes. so uh, who who uh, is uh, uh, coming from the Republic of Turkey pres presidential state archives uh, Dr. Cherchin Lee uh, has recently published uh, uh, the paper um, entitled foreign uh, women affecting the social life of the Ottoman uh, Empire at the beginning of the 20th century the case of late lady uh, Alice Lothar 1873-1939 in World Academy of Science, Engineering and Technology. And this publication has been made in the International Journal of Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, Dr. Chachid Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I am honored uh, for being here. Uh, and at the same time, I will add that this is the uh, holiday of my country. This is the first holiday, but um, I'm so happy here. <laughs> uh, I'm so excited at the same time. Uh, our topic, Creating of European Women's Effort for Gender Equality. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am the last one. And we see lots of uh, fascinating presentation uh, uh, because of this. Maybe I will show you less uh, beautiful pictures for you. Okay. In this first part of uh, this presentation, I will focus on what it means to be a woman in different cultures and time periods. Then I will briefly touch on the history of European women and focus on how the struggle for equal rights of European women in general is covered in the Turkish press. Finally, I will touch on the perception of European women as well. Since we are going to talk about women, we can start with being born as a daughter in geographical differences and traditionals. Born in Kazakhstan, different geography and Yes, we say this time, yes. When we look at its from today, social structures that can be relatively egalitarian and fair in terms of test distribution are encountered especially in the field geography, where work, uh, work, workforce is needed. It is seen that there is such a family structure, especially in nomadic culture, we know. It is also important to have a daughter although not as much as a boy. As all patriarchal societies based on the father in the line marriage are based on an understanding that excludes women. According to them, a girl is physically weak, less able to move, movement, uh, uh, movement is a divine act, we uh, remember, compared to a boy. Their contribution to family life will never be as much as a son. We can go on with examples you may know. In the pre-Islamic period, Arab tradition, daughters were killed after they were born by her father. At this point, I would like to point out that Turkish and Arabic traditions usually confused with each other. 
Bomber statues are very different in Turks at that time. For, in, for instance, Hans wife, Hatun, can even uh, take over the management of the army. Back to the Arabic culture, girls are given names even today with a number, meaning in this culture. Maybe you know, this is the Saniye or Rabia. Saniye meaning the second, Rabia meaning the fourth, can be given as an example for this situation. In Turkish too, this is so interesting name maybe, you will hear for the first time, enough. Really, is, uh, this is the name, enough. And we see the, uh, we see the last word, that additional some name, last rose, last light. It includes a wish, actually. By this way, other child can be sung. If we pass ancient China, we must, uh, we must state that women and girls are not even given names, but are called with a similar number, numbering system. Number one, number two. It is also known that being born male in the same region is associated with being luckier. In fact, when the examples reflected in the uh, literature are examined, it is possible to see the striking, striking explanatories of some female characters. These characters state that they were born as men in their previous lives, but were sent back to the world as women due, due to some mistakes they made. We know that the ancient Romans didn't adapt marriage because they considered, they considered women the mother, uh, mother of all evils. Uh, I remember this uh, Pandora box. If a woman gives birth to a girl or disabled child, her husband has the right to kill her. We can talk about many patriarchal communities and sexist perceptions like this. We can include Plato, Platons, Aristoteles, thoughts on female gen uh, gender, but although there are minor exceptions, it will be seen that the general result has not changed. If we approach the pres present historically, we see that girls are not wanted in Afghanistan. And yes, we see it. Uh, maybe you know the journalist Jenny Nordberg, uh, underground girls of Chabi, in search of hidden resistance in Afghanistan. Uh, she mentions about the Azita. Azita, and continue with that. Yes. Uh, Azita is the mother of four daughters. Uh, this is the real story. She tried to win the freedom of the, her other uh, daughters by dressing and raising Mihran, the youngest of her daughters, as a boy. In addition, protecting her own political life and her husband's honor was the reason for this behavior. Having at least, Azita said that, having at least one son is uh, mandatory, mandatory for success and reputation here. Without it, a family is not only incomplete, but also seen as weak and fragile in a country without the rule of law. Therefore, a married woman is oblig obligated to quickly give birth to a son. That is her absolute goal in life. Women who cannot give sons in a patriarchal culture and fundament fundamentally populates uh, both in the eyes of society and in themselves. Out of Azita's daughter, there are too many women who uh, don't have to live like men do, due to choice of their family, but wear men's clothes as a form of uh, protection due to social conditions. Now, let me, show, let me show you three women. Two of them from the news takes place in press, the other one is um, based on archival. Yes, we see Miss Sebile, and uh, a 33-year-old woman who earns by selling cakes by wearing men's clothes uh, from Tokat was also reported in the newspaper. As an other, yes, we see two women in this German woman. As an example of a similar situation, Mary Einstein wore men's clothing for uh, 13 years and was accepted as a man in society. 
When her true identity was revealed, she said that she and Evan Miller were unemployed and living in the park and that, and that such an idea come to their mind as a solution. In addition to this, let's continue with an interesting uh, example. We see, yes, I will, okay. We see, um, no, we see a document that mentions Arshe, and who served as a man in the army in the last of the, uh, last of the Ottoman Empire. Arshe did her military service for two years using the name Mehmet. And this lady who went to, uh, who went to the army to defend her homeland and was uh, Sultan paid the salary. And the other step, uh, on the likes and dislikes of femininity, femininity from the point of the view of men. As we know that many different forms and meanings shaped by the requirements of the time and the value judgments of the society have been attributed to women since the early age. Among these values attributed to women, fertility, which is considered the main reason for the existence of human beings, has come to fall in every society. By the way, I want to add Gimbutas theories in this part. Gimbutas is uh, so important, who made important research on the Neolithic Age and Bronze Age, said that the main factor that enabled the spread of existence was undoubt undoubtedly the feminine power, her thesis, and the people of Hedid worship the goddess. As for women appearance, especially body's importance, the thin woman has been described as the woman of the depression and the fat woman as the woman of the welfare period in our, uh, in our newspaper. Apart from the characteristic of fertility that brings her uh, to the forefront, many deficiencies can be found women have physically and emotionally different nature from men. However, uh, before moving on to that, uh, let's, uh, let's start continuing with the glorif uh, glorified features of uh, women. In many cultures, women represent peace and reconciliations. We heard uh, today reconciliations, yes. Although establishing a state is seen as a man job, the state is often portrayed as a woman. Türkçe bir kitap var, aynı bu şekilde. The cartoon title, Mother State and Children, yes, we know, yes. Children, and one, if, uh, one of them is Istanbul, uh, one of them is Ankara, our capital city. And uh, the woman uh, <coughs> represent the state, yes. Uh, Istanbul, um, Mother state and children is a good example, showing that the state is expressed as both a woman and a mother. Istanbul says that it is Ottoman uh, language and uh, consisted of Arabic and Persian. Uh, Istanbul, I am hungry, mom, I am hungry. Mother state, wait, Ankara, let your brother uh, stop and get me for you. Also, it has been observed that cities other than the state are named in a similar way. Yes, we moved. In the Ottoman press, the city of Istanbul was sometimes depicted as a child and sometimes as a woman. This is the woman. Uh, to point to be emphasized here is the def defenseless structure of the city. And it's also known that European geography is depicted as a woman in art and history. In mythological narratives, as I guess you know, Europe was described as a princess, and it was said that her name was later given to the uh, European continent. On the other hand, as mentioned before, we, um, the family figure symbolized peace. Yes, we go. While seeking, uh, a joint solution for peace at the Lausanne Conference. I'm loving this. We see the female figure symbolizing peace, expressing that she will die spontaneously from waiting. Lausanne, uh, it 
It's written that uh, Lozon chem chemistry house and peace until they prepare the formulas, I think I will die of my own effort. However, it was sometimes said that women reminded them of war rather than peace. Women clothing's choice were effective in this evolution. Uh, yes, another one. Yes. You know the hat? Uh, in this style, uh, remember the war. I don't understand, but um, at the same time, it is written that the features on the hats we see here remind of the war. And other. Yes, in uh, that part, woman clothes uh, like this. This word has uh, another word that emphasizes the soft character of woman is compassion. This word has been mentioned a lot, especially by men, with the argument that it negatively affects the decision-making process with logic, although it carries her soul. Yes, this is. Uh, we see a uh, trick woman, <coughs> and uh, it is written that walk my uh, small baby walk with your sister are calling you, run to them, sweetie, you grow up quite well in this compassionate hands, you become a big, big man. And on women's foreheads, prosperity, justice, and innovations. Britain. In the Ottoman Empire, um, during the Abdul Hamid, uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid time, a new insignia, insignia is this too? Insignia? Signia. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. A new insignia was prepared to honor women. This medal was pursued to be given to women who served for the benefit of the state in various disasters. The word compassion, which emphasized the emotional aspect of woman, was chosen as the name of this uh, insignia. There's also mention other good qualities attributed to woman, goodness, goodness, widely expressed, expressed in the newspaper, that uh, this suits femininity. In fact, when we look at the formation process, and board members of charities, it is possible to, sue, uh, to see women rather than men. The tendency of women in this direction has been a phenomenon that strengths the thesis that they should only work in the mentioned fields by the male-dominated culture. Yes, we see European women from the past to present. Uh, the fight for rights on European in the Turkish press. Although there are many different answers to the question of what uh, one of the most revolutionary ideas in the world history, perhaps the most important is the idea that people are born a group. This argument, which can be considered as the basic principle of the struggle for existence of different segments of the society, is an important principle for both working class men women from all classes and minorities. If the principle is to be analyzed for women, it is necessary to focus on the problematic of whether the definition of being human includes women or within which limits. As a matter of fact, the struggle of women in this fight is multifaceted. When examined the women's issue, which is the focus of this study. From a European-centered and historical process, it is seen that there are various breaking points. Starting, starting from a little behind, uh, we should mention that prejudices about the women in med medieval Europe were not different from previous period. Starting the subjects in terms of the accepting, uh, acceptance of Christ Christianity and the change, some efforts will contribute to the historical background. With the adoption of Christianity in Rome, a new era began for women. This period has both positive and negative aspects. One of the positive aspects is undoubtedly that women in need of asylum we uh, uh, were able to enter church and monasteries. Considering the conditions of the era and the region, the church is one of the rare places where women have the chance to get education. 
a woman who received education here can also educate another girl. In fact, according to some authors, uh, it is one of the reasons behind the higher number of women. Uh, in the sorcery, in the part scanning, uh, in the 15th century, the church will take a different form for women. In general, there is a toxic situation in Europe, and um, all good says about this situation, the existence of an state in the region, and separation of the Orthodox Church, and the fact that people have a, a structure that can break with tradition. On the other hand, when... Yes, thank you, I'm scanning, yes. Okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. We see an excellent philosopher, I'm scanning that part, mostly men, they are. Grounded the issue of women's equal rights or natural rights. However, women uh, could not benefit from this right because of the philosopher of the period tied uh, to base these rights on nature. Yes, okay. When listening to Olin to Bosch, Olin, Olin to Bosch, yes, this is the famous uh, for Turkey. This affects lots of uh, women. And um, uh, Olin to Bosch, who published the first woman rights the declaration in history on September, 791. Man, can you be fair? A woman is asking you this question. At least you can take that right away from him. And like this, more, uh, adopting the French Declaration of Citizenship to Women, Gauche statement had a significant impact uh, among those who fought for women's equality. Uh, as I said before, she affected. Uh, we see that she was mentioned in the Turkish press. And at the same time, uh, Frederick Caroline, Caroline von Schoenmegel, as an example to women from uh, the struggle for. Yes, I change. Yes, we see another model is Emily Pankhorst, who fought hard for women to vote on an equal rights with men, was also mentioned in the newspaper as one of the pioneers. Two words quoted in the new published in the Akshan newspaper in 80, uh, in 38, show how willing Pankhurst is to, to, to defend women's rights. It represents <coughs> uh, the, biggest, the biggest revolutionary woman, Emeline Pankhurst. It has been 10 years since this woman who used bombs, starts fires, and finally trumped to the, the woman to write what? Yes, and we see, no, no, I'm scanning, we see English, British uh, woman, and uh, the news in the newspaper in which there are 15 women deputies in the parliament in the new British election in England. Yes, this is, this is other one, this is the late Astor is uh, famous for in Turkey, and uh, uh, Turkish women organized some conference, they asked or uh, is coming, who was among the first deputies. According to her, the women's moment is a revolutionary moment, revolutions overdue and change stays. After women gained the right vote, the new states start and the, uh, this uh, voting race. I'm scanning that part. Yes. We see uh, in Turkish press closely follow the uh, Europe, USA, and that time uh, Soviet, and we written one uh, the uh, up woman and other men you may guess. And then now, yes, we see the voting rates and a woman of the world gathering in Istanbul to defend women's rights. The fact that Ms. Ashby spoke three languages, it's so interesting for Turkish uh, women, that the flag of the suffragettes with the word justice. Okay, okay. And the other 
Yes, we see European woman and Ottoman woman, and yes, we see uh, one minute for one minute. minute. Okay, lots of things, unfortunately. Yes, okay, okay, okay. I have lots of psychologists, European psychologists, men say about the woman, but okay. Okay, that after the war period, war periods, the struggle of women in Europe for gender equality came to the fore more in Turkish press, in which sectors women work and the feminist policies implemented by the countries were closely followed, especially the rights that Spanish and Portuguese women gained after six days were featured in the newspaper. It is seen that the work, works describing Europe or are handled more by women writers. And uh, England, Germany, Norway, Estonia, Romania, Serbia are governed by female leaders. It is so interesting. And conclusion, a, uh, a large number of women who have experienced the same deprivation in different countries, West or East, have struggled to have equal rights in the male world. This struggle was waged against men trying to maintain their privileged position in society. At times, the men were accompanied by women who thought the same as men. Therefore, it will be appropriate to say that women's rights defenders are fighting, fighting on many fronts, as if their struggle to obtain rights is not enough. Before concluding my speech, Susan Antony, this is Elizabeth Kelly, founder of the Equal Rights Association, Stanton and Matilda, another strong activist, Rosalind, I want to commemorate, without forgetting Alice Paul, an uh, anonymous woman who are on strike for women's suffragette. My suggestion is to raise awareness. The problem of the, of the age is to invest in education, we know. I repeat, Mary's, the most perfect education should be an education that will make the individual gain the virtues that will make her independent. And I thank you all with the hope of meeting in the days when a dynamic concept such as human rights, whose scope uh, changed and can be renewed over time, doesn't leave women rights on a separate ground when everyone uh, is considered equal. Thank you. So the English is really bad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much for, for your paper. Now, there are questions or comments? Yes, Sonia. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you very much for, for this uh, very broad uh, overview. Um, I was wondering about the, the rates, the ratio, the percentage of women in, in the Turkish parliament, and mm. how has it evolved over the years? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. It, uh, I'm not giving the uh, uh, current uh, rates, mm. but uh, it improves. Uh, we can see the loss of parliaments, uh, Turkish women. Mm. Uh, uh, what can I say? I don't know. Do Maybe I, I'm examine and I will send an email. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that's also very interesting that we look beyond the borders of Europe and, and also what's happening elsewhere because we tend to have a very Eurocentric uh, uh, by pro probably professional deformation, but I think we should also be aware of these uh, bias as well. Um, I was just wondering, and perhaps you're not able to, to answer, but obviously I understand that, you know, everything that's this this fights of Europe of Western European women, I mean Western Europe broadly conceived as has been we see you know, has been registered in the in the Turkish press. And I was wondering the extent to which this recension of these fights uh, or debates on, you know, gender 
gender, you know, women's rights, gender equality, parity, etc., has been a source of inspiration for Turkish women, or has been maybe, you know, something to emulate. And again, it's fine if you, if you, I understand that goes a little bit beyond your, uh, the confines of your paper, but just if... You asked that, uh, what is the inspiration? Well, the, the, to what extent, if at all, uh, you know, these debates about women's rights or women's, you know, gender rights gender, yeah. has been, you know, the way it was received in the press, because obviously well, the press is read also by women, Mm -hmm. uh, if that was something that, you know, served as an inspiration for a Turkish woman, that, you know, if Western Europeans do that, well, why not us? Hmm. Uh, first of all, um, I said you, in Turkish women, uh, struggle for, uh, for gender equality and uh, maybe marriages mm -hmm. with one uh, woman is so important for our women. And you know, maybe uh, our men uh, can marry it for uh, women at the same time. And yes. With the luxury. Yes, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Or not. <laughs> yes. And then, uh, uh, and then, um, by other Turkey, you know, our, our country established and uh, forbidden this uh, traditions. But uh, Europe, uh, women uh, in the Tanzimat period in the Ottoman Empire, unfortunately, can't uh, can't uh, go out of the home, not uh, not not go out uh, from home uh, without a man. Mm. And a European woman, a European woman, and uh, really freedom. Uh, compared with the Turkish woman. But uh, all Turkish time, uh, woman is freedom. And um, as I may guess, this Arabic uh, traditions affect uh, Turkish woman's lifestyle. And uh, in this period, uh, the Turkish woman's activists uh, follow the uh, European woman and interaction with each other, maybe during the time, during the war time, working women uh, lost uh, the uh, feminist activities and the feminist activities for a while for the defend the uh, nations, defend the state. Uh, and they, they come, Turkish women uh, established, uh, continue to establish the uh, journal uh, named Kadınlar Dünyası, Birth of the Women's. And uh, I believe that interaction is so important, and a European woman moment encourage Turkish women and other uh, non western women. Uh, I believe that lots of things. It is so limited time, I think. Thank you. Oh. So, th thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Milia, for your presentation. Okay. Thank you, uh, you all, for your question and comments. And if you permit, at the end, I will draw some conclusion of our meeting. First of all, it was a very exciting uh, meeting with inspiring debates, with uh, uh, very um, dense exchanges, and uh, that give us uh, plenty of idea and of path to continue our uh, research and maybe to have new cooperation in this, uh, in this uh, um, research. Uh, our um, seminar was about interdisciplinarity. We have historian, politics, uh, uh, scientist, um, uh, uh, literature studies, and so on. So uh, uh, plenty of horizons, of concepts, and of uh, uh, critical uh, categories uh, which are put together in this uh, synergy. Then uh, we um, di discussed about sources, archival sources, uh, new created sources, the oral history, and multimedia 
sources. So uh, all all this uh, discussion with a very uh, strong digital um, 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 dimension. Uh, we identify also a, a constellation of approaches, a top down, bottom up approach from the old Europe, new Europe, Europe uh, seen as a continent, Europe seen as a dialogue of culture, of civilization, uh, Europe before enlargement, Europe with the last enlargement, to the Central and Eastern Europe, and also to the candidate, so Turkey, uh, which is a candidate to, to European integration. And in, in this uh, dialogue, um, formal, informal, transnational, multi-dimension, cultural, spiritual, the ethos, the Polish ethos, we can um, design and um, interpret in uh, in-depth Europe, past, present, and future. We also have um, concept, institutions, mechanism, association, pro-Europe, anti-Europe, um, lobby, East-West uh, East dialogue, but we have also key figures uh, and funding mothers, funding uh, personalities uh, of Europe as ladies, uh, females in this, uh, uh, in this phenomenon, Katharina Fouke, Marianne Camps, uh, Fausta Delorme de Laval. Uh, we, au revoir. Bon voyage. Merci. Uh, we have also uh, this kind of uh, new tendencies in European integration in the broader sense of term through social Europe, gender equality, uh, and uh, vocation and uh, careers uh, of women. Um, I would like to invite you to think about uh, all this point raised these days. I will invite you to submit your papers uh, when we uh, get uh, the precisions from the editor, from the Greuter. And I really hope that we'll, we'll stay in touch in having the synergy between our universities, our research centers, uh, our teams, and our persons. So have a, a safe trip back at home, and uh, we hope that we will see you uh, again very soon in Luxembourg. So thank you very much.